surgeons were more eager to proceed to a latage or a bony procedure. Okay, and, okay, and, okay, okay, Jean, we are going live. Yes, yeah. sir, going okay. live. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Tanjan, sir, we can start. Yes. So I think we go ahead with the first speaker. That's going to be Dr. Vikas Kapoor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Vikas. You, you start, you go ahead with the, this is the live now. Live now. You give the inaugural yeah. thing and then we'll go ahead. Okay. So I'll share my screen. No, no. So, Kanchan, sir, you just go give some inaugural thing, then only we'll start. Dr. Vikas Kapoor is the medical uh, director of orthopedics in Medica uh, Hospital in Calcutta. And he is uh, one of the founder members of CAS, a very renowned surgeon in arthroscopy and arthroplasty. And it's my pleasure to invite him to begin the proceedings today. So thank you, Kanchanda, for the kind words. And uh, shall I start the share screen on my uh, this thing? Yeah, please. Yeah. So uh, well, uh, that's where we are. So. So can everybody see this? Oh, yes. You, you have to, yes. yes, it's coming, coming. Yes. It's coming? Yes. Right. Yes. Perfect. So uh, we start with uh, shoulder instability, clinical and radiological evaluation. And this is uh, not going to be very extensive. I'll try to touch upon certain things because there is a lot of information which has come into the radiological evaluation of shoulder instabilities and uh, how we have found out about minor instabilities with the help of radiology in recent times. So what is basically instability? It's a, a normal shoulder, a humeral head is centered within the glenoid and coracromial arch. So when the shoulder cannot maintain this centered position, it is said to, to be unstable. It is not the same as joint laxity, it is different because laxity allows the shoulder to attain its full range of motion, functional position, while an unstable shoulder prevents the normal function of the upper extremity. So we have to look at it from that perspective. Now, basically, for a common uh, general orthopedic surgeon beyond uh, sports injuries uh, would understand instability of shoulder in the terms of shoulder dislocation. So there are three basic uh, types which we have been teaching for a long time, and that is anterior, posterior, and inferior. And similarly, these instabilities are classified and kind of uh, categorized into these three directions, including MDI, which includes one of each, uh, at least two of them. Now, clinical evaluation, there has been for a long, long time, these are standard tests, and I would go run through them quickly. The most easier, I mean, talked about test is the apprehension test with the patient sitting. Clinician, one of us stands behind, shoulder in abduction, aber position, and we try to push the head anteriorly, and the patient does uh, kind of resist it. And when the apprehension test we find is positive, we do just the reverse of that, and the kind of relief the patient gets is uh, labeled as a, a relocation test. The draw test, it is a similar type of test while the patient is lying down supine, in a position again, uh, the shoulder is rotated, externally rotated in flexion and, and 90 degree abduction and relaxed. And the humeral head is pulled anteriorly like a draw test after stabilizing the scapula and the shoulder. Posterior instability, similarly, uh, in the, uh, well, uh, in, like the draw test, it, patient is supine, shoulder out of the table, similar position, and we try to push the shoulder posteriorly and release the pressure. Push-pull test, another variant where you do the same thing in a different way. Hold the wrist and elbow in 90 degree flexion, 90 abduction, scapular plane, neutral rotation, and other hand is on mid-humerus and applies the posterior force. For the inferior instability, the patient is made to sit or supine with both uh, forearm on the mid femur. Inferior pull on both forearm can lead to a uh, very minor sulcus sign in cases where you have uh, mild instabilities, but it may not be very easily perceptible in very minor instabilities. Sulcus sign, this is a very, very old uh, photograph we have gone through in all the test books. This is in cases of uh, recurrent dislocation of shoulder or in acute cases of dislocation shoulder, rarely seen in these, in these times and era. 
The inferior apprehension test is done standing. The patient places his elbow on the examiner's shoulder. The examiner's hand circulate above the shoulder. Apply the inferior force. If it is positive, uh, the, there is apprehension and reproduces symptom. And compare always with the other side to find out whether you are actually having it on one side due to traumatic instability. O'Brien's test, which is the active compression test, this is uh, important for uh, maybe in certain cases of slap or AC joint pathology, where you forward flex uh, the shoulder in 90 degrees, adduct in 10 to 15 degrees, maximum internal rotation, and try to resist the force of the patient, which is resist the downward force. And it can be repeated in supination. And of course, it loads the AC joint and superior labrum may indicate a slap or AC joint pathology. Now coming, so basically clinical evaluation, you don't have much beyond what patient is telling you and you kind of try to correlate with your radiological findings. Radiological findings, they, we cannot discount into the, today's world after the MRIs have come and they have led us to see so many things which we'll see. They, uh, first, of course, is the X-ray which you need to do and you need to know the anatomical landmarks in a proper AP view of X-ray as it is seen here. There are certain X-ray views which we need to discuss uh, up beyond the AP view, which we just saw. It's the transcapular Y view, which sh shows us the full uh, face of the glenoid. And you can actually from here know what type of dislocation one is dealing with, especially the posterior dislocation, which is not easily seen. Uh, it's discernible in the AP view of the X-rays. So here, as you can see, this view is very useful when you want to see which way the humeral head is going. Axillary view has a very limited role in a very painful shoulder, but does show a lot of anterior glenoid pathology. Sometimes you can see end on glenoid on this side. And uh, uh, well, it's a traditional view which we have been doing to see the glenoid. The striker notch view also tells you how uh, these are the things which you see. And the angle it is uh, cephalate 10 degrees. The beam is with the shoulder up, uh, forward placed and on the head. And this helps you to see from the inferior to superior edge of the shoulder and identify the pathologies which are missed. West point view is a view which is uh, used to see the inferior uh, uh, glenoid area. And uh, it's like, uh, it's the, as you can see, the patient lies uh, posterior uh, pr prone and the X-ray beams are uh, cephalate 25 degrees from the horizontal. So there are, these are the views in uh, detail, AP, AP in internal rotation, external ro rotation, scapular Y view, axillary view, and the West Point views. These are the standard things which you see, expect to see in the X-rays, the anterior uh, dislocation of shoulder, anterior inferior. Uh, in cases where you have reduced it and there is an accessory damage to the teres minor or infraspinatus muscles in a severe dislocation post-reduction, sometimes you will see uh, loose bodies or extra calcifications. Uh, the hill sacs lesion, the engaged hill sacs, uh, and the luxatio erecta, if you get a photograph like that. Now, CT scan is an excellent uh, thing which has come up in last so many years. There have been various classifications which have come up, various understand understandings of instability which has come up post CT scan era in last 25, 30 years. Subtle fractures, complex fractures, and bony defects are assessed. We have been able to quantify the size of the glenoid, how the glenoid uh, fractures are there, various bony pathologies associated with instability with the help of CT scan. And here you can see uh, what uh, we have, since we have been able to quantify the glenoid sizes, we can understand which one is a small and dysplastic glenoid, which is leading to instability. We can talk and see how big is the hill sacs lesion, where is the hill sacs lesion. We have come to understood the bony bank cart lesion, which was not known very well earlier. And we can also see and understand where are the associated abnormalities in the humeral head besides hill sacs lesion uh, in a dislocation of. Uh, uh, posterior dislocation or an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. This is a very, very important development which has happened in the understanding of uh, the glenoid bone loss, the PICO method. Uh, basically, it is a pear-shaped uh, glenoid always. So we take uh, inferior two-third as uh, the radius of curvature and make a circle. And that circle gives us the full extent of glenoid, the face of glenoid on which the humeral head rests. Now, if there is any kind of loss of anterior edge of glenoid, 
we are able to quantify and see how much glenoid loss is there and accordingly plan our surgeries. Usually it is about 26 millimeters, 24 to 26 millimeters in diameter. So if a bone loss of more than six to eight millimeters is found in the anterior region, we usually find that this may need some kind of a bony procedure. Some people have a higher threshold, some have a lower threshold based on these decisions and their experiences to do a larger J procedure or a bony procedure anteriorly in such cases and a CT. And this particular method is very, very helpful. Here we can quantify what kind uh, the engaging and a non-engaging hill sac lesion. So a hill sac lesion, which is actually uh, horizontal with, uh, in, a, in a plane to glenoid, more horizontal in a plane to glenoid, will tend to engage and therefore needs to be uh, filled up uh, hill sac or, or addressed. And the hill sac lesion, which is vertical in its own uh, in the plane to glenoid or parallel to glenoid, will have less chances of engaging and therefore is a non-engaging lesion, may not need uh, too much of uh, redressal once we do an anterior shoulder stabilization surgery. This is an important uh, thing which we need to calculate. We need to, uh, here we can see the arc of loss of uh, uh, humeral head in a hill sac lesion. So if it is less than 20 degrees, you really don't need to kind of go ahead and address the hill sac lesion. But if it is more than 20 to 40 degrees, you need to do something to fill up that defect so that uh, posteriorly also when you address the anterior instability of shoulder. After the uh, CT scan, we come, come down to the choicest of investigation today, which is the MRI. It is the modality of choice. It has led to understanding instability in no ways which has been understood earlier. Uh, there can be n number of lectures on this particular subject, but I would keep it restricted to a small number of slides to understand the basic and main things. So anteriorly, primary, we have four different types of instability lesions which are seen in an MRI. The first one, of course, is the Bankart's lesion, which we all know the, uh, the anterior labrum, anterior inferior liberal pathology, which leads to shoulder instability. Perthes lesion is a lesion where you have a, a Bankart, which is associated with a bit of periosteal sleeve, which goes up. But technically, the labrum of the Bankart, uh, labrum, glenoid labrum anteriorly, remains close or at the edge of the uh, uh, the glenoid and sometimes it remains uh, kind of uh, it doesn't it looks quite innocuous while operating and can be missed also but this is an important lesion causes painful anterior instability of the shoulder absa lesion is a lesion where the periosteal sleeve is avulsed and the glenoid is lying uh, the labrum is lying into the uh, anterior wall you know of the scapula and it is it is not at its place and it has to be retrieved back and therefore this is a associated it is found in a lot of our cases which we do in this subcontinent where we have recurrent anterior dislocations and it is not that we get fresh cases after one or two dislocation which is likely to be a Perthes or a Bankart's lesion. So we do see a lot of Alsa lesion here. Now GLAD lesion is a lesion missed a lot but it is a very painful lesion where you have a liberal pathology but at the same same time, you have an articular defect on the anterior surface. And 9% of the liberal pathologies anteriorly are found to be associated with some kind of articular defect. And this is a painful pathology besides being an unstable pathology. Associated lesions of anterior are Hagel lesions or humeral avulsion of glenoid labrum. It can happen at three different places, but primarily it is associated with the humeral avulsion. Sometimes a bony sleeve of humerus is avulsed. Sometimes it can also happen at the middle of the ligament, uh, anterior, the glenohumeral ligament, and uh, it has variations. Some, some lesions have been said it is like a floating glenolabral ligamentous complex where you have band cards associated with an haggle and therefore the whole band is floating. And after fixing the band card, sometimes the shoulder remains painful and unstable. It is more because we have been not been able to address the humeral end of this particular lesion. The tear of inferior band of inferior glenohumeral ligament and axillary hammock causes the anterior inferior recess uh, pain and instability. The multidirectional is uh, lacks IGHL and axillary recess and lacks rotator interval also is one of the reasons of instability which is often mixed but can be identified in a well done MRI. So now we come to the major posterior instabilities, which is the posterior bony bankers, which is self-evident here and in CT scan both. 
partially detached posterior labrum which is like a bankart but it is also missed because it is not completely detached this is a painful lesion kim's lesion has been identified as a compressed uh, labrum posteriorly now this is a situation where you have an instability which is subtle but which is painful and it is not corrected if we don't address this lesion completely because it looks like a reasonably frayed glenoid on the posterior aspect and cause repetitive instability even if the labrum is there if we can see the labrum in arthroscopy but this labrum needs to be understood and identified identified as a pathological labrum and needs to be bumped up the gard lesion is the opposite of the glad lesion it is exactly similar if you see in the anterior side there is a this this is associated with a labral pathology along with a chondral defect on the posterior side well we come down to other subtle minor instabilities which are traumatic which is uh, the most common is the slap lesion we have conventionally and for all practical purposes understood type four types of slap lesions which you can see evidently here and uh, it is about the partial fraying of the bicep the complete tear of the uh, uh, sorry complete tear of the labrum uh, labrum falls into the joint and labrum uh, tear extends into the biceps but of course uh, the variation of all these uh, four primary types is from 5 to 10 and it can extend anteriorly posteriorly down up to 6 o'clock position it can go uh, rim wise and so there are various uh, differences but primary four lesions one of these will be there associated and then it can be subclassified into 5 to 10 uh, slap lesions now i would end almost come to the end of this because it's it's a very large subject uh, acquired minor shoulder instabilities which need to be understood as far as uh, things which are there uh, in uh, throwing athletes uh, so Uh, need to be understood also now there are other things which are incidentally found in uh, mri which have led us to understand the instability patterns which are perplexing and which are not associated with several uh, previously understood instabilities like absent mghl double mghl which is a cord like structure bufford's complex is a very very important uh, uh, thing to understand we do see uh, once in a while uh, who do a reasonably good number of shoulder instability cases absence uh, labrum uh, sa lab, uh, labrum with thick mghl and this needs to be understood as something uh, normal variant it is not and it can cause instability and sublabral foramina which is also an incidental mri finding which we understood after having seen the mri in thousands well it can go on and on but i think i'll have to end somewhere the ultrasound nowadays has very limited use in instability absolutely i think it is of no use as far as i am concerned it is out in my practice but in rotator cuff tears and it because if you have a very good operator and uh, of course affordability issues which are not there here so much because of the limited cost of mri i think uh, ultrasound has a very limited role in imaging of the labrum and instabilities thank you very much thank you vikas yeah uh you've covered almost everything there's not much to be asked now we have um, the panelists here and the panelists shwanandu samanta abhi karan biplob dolui so uh are we taking questions now or later i think i think let's take the questions at the end so that we finish everything and we can ask yes, yes, yes. i think that's better so now may I... may i invite dr raju ishwaran to speak on assessment of bone loss thank you raju for being with us here so raju ishwaran i'm sure all of you know about him he is a senior consultant at max hospital in delhi and works out of minakshi sports uh, uh, sports injury center and orthopedic clinic in uh, delhi uh, a person of multifaceted talent who has uh, was instrumental in getting a website for the indian arthroscopy society uh, has taught us all about prezi presentation has got a wide information about all that is happening in the country and the world about anything about the knee and knee and shoulder and a man who's brought to us how what you can do 
in improving yourself physically if you really put your mind to it. Raju, it's all, all yours now. Thank you so much. Uh, I would surely make my wife listen to these high words of praise. Uh, I'm sure she'd be quite delighted to discover this uh, side of me. But anyway, thank you for the Kolkata Arthroscopy and Sports Surgery Society for this kind invitation. I'm grateful uh, to their invitation and to the previous speaker who has given a broad overview on uh, what all can we do in terms of imaging in this very wide area. I will just be covering a very small facet that is how to assess for bone loss. And uh, uh, this is a recorded presentation. I just recorded it specially for this purpose. It's in a slightly different format. I'll just be interrupting in between to interject and I'll uh, let the presentation run. Good morning. I'll be speaking on evaluation of bone loss in shoulder instability. And before I begin my presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the help of my colleague, Dr. Nafisa Bhatta. Uh, we both wrote an article on imaging shoulder instability with a focus on identifying bone loss. And most of the images that you'll see in this presentation are referenced from this article. Now looking at imaging, the most obvious imaging which comes to our mind when it comes to any kind of orthopedic imaging is the MRI. But in a situation where you have suspected shoulder instability, an MRI is largely limited to seeing expected soft tissue pathology, the classical capsule osseous or the Bankart lesion, uh, though some colleagues are able to give further useful information with the MRI with terms of glenoid bone loss, hill sacs lesions, etc. These are best studied on investigations like a CT or a X-ray. Now coming to X-ray, uh, these are the two views that I like to take, the true AP view and the Barnajou view. And sometimes it is important to understand how we position our patients for these. Even though it looks very simple, but a true AP view can be sometimes a little difficult to take. And the advantage of a true AP view is that it puts you on the right track. It helps you smell bone loss on the glenoid as well as the humeral hens. And this is how you take it. Now, uh, these three angles are 25, 30 and 45 degrees. That is, the X-ray beam is angled 20 degrees cephalad. The patient is positioned around 30 degrees uh, with the affected shoulder backward. For example, in this particular illustration, you see the X-ray of the right shoulder being taken. The left shoulder is positioned 30 degrees in front of the right approximately. This angle may vary from person to person. And the forearm is held in the neutral or the mid-prone position uh, with the angle at 45 degrees from the coronal plane. So if you want to take a 45 degree internal rotation view, the forearm would touch the abdomen, the hand would touch the abdomen. And if you want to take a 45 degree external rotation view, uh, the dorsum of the hand would touch the, uh, the wall that is behind this particular lady. And this is what you get out of a good true AP view, the loss of double cortical line for more than five millimeters from the inferior cortex. As can be seen here on the left, you can see an intact double cortical line. On the right, you can see the blunting of the double cortical line and also a small fragment that lies in the axillary recess. So that puts you on the track. And since uh, most orthopedic surgeons would like to see things at right angles to each other, the right angle to an AP view is actually not the axillary view from the instability perspective. It is what we call the Barnajou view. Uh, the advantage of this view is that it helps you see the glenoid in full profile and uh, there are multiple ways you can position your patient for the Barnajou view. This is the easiest for the So I'll interrupt here and uh, one easy way to remember the Barnajou view positioning, I'll just share my desktop, uh, is if any one of you has uh, visited my hometown uh, Trivandrum and the Padmanabha Swami temple, uh, you would see the Lord Vishnu in this particular pose uh, is known as the Ananta Shayanam. And that is perhaps the best way to remember how to do a good Barnajou view. So if you are able to position the patient in this posture, which is generally comfortable to most instability patients, they will tolerate it well. So I'll now reshare the presentation and go. Patient, and especially remember that you are imaging a patient who has shoulder instability. He needs to have some level of comfort as well while positioning for this particular X-ray. So the angles concerned are 15 and 25 degrees. 15 degrees is the angle that's the white arrow, the angle with which the X-ray beam is aligned with respect to the vertical. And you need to position the patient forward usually by 25 to 30 degrees. And this will vary with the build of the patient so that the opposite shoulder is away from the view and you get an X-ray which looks a bit like this. 
A well-done Barnaju view will show not only the hill sacs as marked by the black star, it will also show blunting of the anterior glenoid as marked by the white star. So, an x-ray puts you on the track. It makes you suspicious that, yes, my patient may have a bone loss, which I need to further analyze. And the best way to do that is through a CT scan. CT is the preferred modality for bone loss. And there are essentially four ways by which bone loss can be quantified on a CT scan. Uh, eponymously known as the Griffith method. It's a 2D based method, a diameter based method, wherein the opposite glenoid is used as a reference. The PICO method, which again is the same method, uh, but it's an area-based method and a length-based method. So the essential difference between Griffith and PICO is that while one assesses the difference in the diameter, the other assesses a difference in the area. Since area is a square of the diameter, both these methods don't vary that much when it comes to assessment of bone loss in terms of ratios or percentages. The well-known Sugaya method, which is done on a 3D on FOS view of the glenoid, uh, that only needs the uh, ipsilateral glenoid for you to assess. And then there is the newer concept of the glenoid track, uh, which references a bipolar bone loss, bone loss both at the glenoid and at the humeral head. So let us through, uh, look through an example of how these methods look in real life. So this is the PICO and the Griffith method on this particular patient's right glenoid. And again, you see there is nothing much to separate between the two because one is a diameter-based measurement and the other is an area-based measurement. Hear you. I think I think I think uh, there is a problem with uh, Raju's connection. Mm. Video not showing. Just don't pause. The okay. internet connection is not working. In the meantime, I just asked Jap and Kenny, Doctor Kenny, do you do because we do, we don't do the sort of CT arthrogram in our clinical practice? Do you do still in your country? Is, uh, Jap, what's your opinion in instability scenario? Or is just do it for the cuffs only? Jap, you have to unmute yourself. Jap, you are muted. Yeah. I, uh, I use an MRI arthrogram standard and a CT scan if I want to evaluate the bone loss. Actually, we developed a method that you can use the MRI for measuring the, uh, the bone loss. But I have to confess that the CT is, at the end, more reliable than the MRI in assessing the bone loss. But uh, I don't use CT autogram. Most of the patients are young, and I try to avoid too much radiation for these uh, young people. Dr. Kenny, your opinion on that? Dr. Kenny, you have to unmute yourself. I think you are muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got temporarily disconnected. There's okay. a thunderstorm in Delhi and that led to bad internet. I am happy to resume the presentation from where I left off if that's okay with everyone. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. 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 Jean, just we have continue with Raju, then I will come back to you. I think Jean is still is not visible even. Right. So I'll just take this a bit back. It is. The well-known Sugaya method, which is done on a... So this is the PICO and the Griffith method on this particular patient's right glenoid. And again, you see there is nothing much to separate between the two because one is a diameter-based measurement and the other is an area-based measurement. Uh, one limitation of the Sugaya method is that you need an intact posterior and the inferior margins of the glenoid to do a Sugaya method properly. And once you are able to get a good on fast view of the glenoid, you draw this circle and you can calculate the area of the glenoid bone defect. This can be done directly by a radiologist or as I will tell you later in the presentation, you can use free proprietary software like Image J on how to do it. Now the glenoid track is a mathematical concept. Uh, if you look at in real life experience, it is the area of contact between the humeral head and the glenoid 
in the position of athletic function that is in the position of abduction and external rotation it is mathematically calculated as 0.83 times the glenoid width and then it's here in this concept that you realize the value of glenoid real estate now look at these two illustrations on the left you see a normal glenoid and uh, that's the glenoid track calculated for you on the right you see a glenoid with bone loss the glenoid track is much smaller therefore the presence of a hill sax lesion is far more critical in a person who has a glenoid bone loss compared to a person who does not have a glenoid bone loss and uh, these examples further illustrate the point so you can think of a on track or an off track lesion as a car going on a road with a pothole if the size of the pothole is very big the car is likely to fall into the pothole and teeter off course so something similar happens so if you look at the illustration on the left the cadaver sample on the left uh, the hill sax lesion is well within the confines of the glenoid track this is known as an on track lesion but if the hill sax lesion were a bit too medial or if the glenoid were a bit deficient then it will be what we call as an off track lesion and the management of these two lesions is different whether you ascribe to the philosophy of different ways of managing these lesions it is important to know about their existence and we need to introduce certain standard nomenclature and a simple mathematical formula to calculate the glenoid track capital d is always the width of the normal or the unaffected glenoid small d is the difference in the width between the normal glenoid and the affected glenoid and the glenoid track is calculated by the simple mathematical formula uh, you also need to calculate what is known as the hill sax index it is the widest width of the human femoral head defect and it includes the rotator cuff bridge let's show it through an example so in this particular example uh, you see that the left glenoid has a glenoid track of around 17.7 mm as measured using the previous formula the measurements have been taken using ct scans now the hill sax index of the same patient is measured to be 21.5 so while there is a glenoid track of 17 17.7 the hill sax obviously is much bigger than the glenoid track so this is a case of an off track lesion and you may have to do something to address the hill sax while you are planning a surgical intervention for this particular patient the advantage of ct is that it gives you some value added services for example you can request your radiologist to calculate the length of coracoid for you and in this is particularly useful if you are planning on a bony augmentation like a latarge procedure it is commonly felt that indian coracoids are a little small in size so it is always useful to know the exact size of the exact dimensions of the coracoid before you embark upon the operation now once you have all this data what do you do now is there a way you can calculate these for yourself the answer is yes if you are a little resourceful of course uh, the better way in a busy clinical practice is to go to your radiologist and request him or her to do it for you but in case you are in a setting where the radiologist is not comfortable you can very easily use free software like image j and i would uh, advise all of you uh, to look at this particular article it is an open access article published in arthroscopy technique by nikhil verma's group they have a very nice video which explains how to use the images which are captured from a mobile phone and how to do the bone loss calculations on them it just takes a few minutes to understand and maybe a few uh, days to implement in your usual practice but then as i said the best is obviously if the radiologist can tell these findings to you directly now once you have all this data with you what do you do with it how does it help you in your treatment uh, there are two scores which can guide you in the right direction uh previously the isis the instability severity score was the previously used it was uh, popularized by uh, pascal boileau uh, each of these points is given two points like the presence of a hill sax on a ap view is two points loss of double cortical line less than 20 years of age and participation in competitive sports so these four add to eight points one point each is given to participation in contact sports or overhead sports and shoulder hyperlaxity so please note that it is not generalized hyperlaxity it is shoulder hyperlaxity a score of 6 or more than 6 is considered to be a poor prognostic indicator of just a soft tissue repair like an arthroscopic bank card uh, these days in fact i use the gti ms score as popularized by the giovanni di giacomo's group 
Now, it essentially looks at the same parameters. The only difference is that an on-track hill sack is given zero points. So instead of the X-ray, you use the CT to assess. And the off-track uh, hill sacks is given four points. The same age less than 20 being given two points, participation in competitive sports, uh, contact sports and hyperlaxity. The rest all is the same as the ISIS score. And again, as I pointed out, this hyperlaxity is shoulder hyperlaxity. Two tests are used to measure it. The Walsh test, that is external rotation till the coronal plane with the arm adducted. And the Gagey test, that is the ability to passively abduct the shoulder beyond 105 degrees. So once you have done all the scoring, you will at least be able to arrive at some kind of a treatment plan for your patient. I thank you very much indeed for your kind attention. Uh, thanks. So I end my presentation and uh, whenever the moderator feels like we can take questions towards the end. Thank you, Raju. Wonderful, Adan. And like we decided, we'll take all the questions at the end. So I'll invite everybody else. I'll ask everybody to keep a note of the questions they have in mind. But both the speakers have been very exhaustive and very uh, elaborate in their descriptions. There will be questions only for clarifications. May I now invite my good friend, Dr. Devashis Chatterjee, who is a pioneer of arthroscopic surgery in this part of the world, a person of great talent in terms of arthroscopy, as well as very knowledgeable in most things that we deal with. And I keep telling him, that all his degrees that is acquired and he's got all of them is wasted because he only does arthroscopic surgery now. He is the director of Tulip, uh, uh, Tulip uh, Nursing Home, uh, which is a hospital which uh, runs on three different specialities and works out of Nightingale uh, Nursing Home as well. Dr. Devas is Chatterjee. <clears throat> right, Kanchanda, thanks for the kind words. So let me go straight to my topic, which is arthroscopic bankers repair. Is it visible? Hello? No, it's not coming. It's not coming. Why? Yeah, you, have, you, have, you have to just share the screen. No problem. Yes, yes, yes. Share screen. Right. Can you see it now? Not there now, yes. yes sir. Right. Right, so we are talking about arthroscopic bankers repair. Um, and as uh, Raju has correctly said, this is still useful for patients with purely soft tissue instability, maybe with IC score less than six and all. Uh, I'm not going into that. I'm going straight into the uh, procedure. The bankers repair basically has got the three components. Um, the problem here is mostly on the anterior inferior half of the genoid, as you can see. To be more precise, on the anterior inferior quadrant, from about six o'clock to say about three or maybe two o'clock region. And in this region, which is involved with the instability, the soft tissue procedure involves three things. First, the reattachment of the capsulolabral tissue using suture anchors, you put them back. And then you also do the anterior and inferior capsular plication to make them tight. And you also try and shift the capsule to a cephalad direction. So these three things will be tried. Am I audible clearly? Yes, nice note. Yeah. Right. So the steps in the operation are, as you know, the anesthesia, then positioning, before that examination under anesthesia, then the portal placement, the diagnostics OP, and confirmation of pathology and plan accordingly. Then you release the capsulolabral tissue and prepare the anterior glenoid margin and the neck. Then you place the first anchor, the single most important anchor, the lowest inferior most anchor correctly and do a capsular stitch and shift. And then you go on putting the subsequent anchors. So we are going to describe that using our uh, video. First, the positioning. Uh, we use GA for all our uh, bankers repairs. And I prefer to do it in lateral position 
that is um, the patient in about arm 70 degree abducted and it is not strict lateral with about that torso posteriorly tilted about 30 degrees <clears throat> so that the glenoid face becomes horizontal <clears throat> excuse me and the lateral traction of about 15 pounds uh, to keep the arm uh, abducted in that position but before you put the patient in this position after anesthesia you must do the examination under anesthesia check the instability by anterior load shift test the translation also check the sulcus test you also check the range of movement, especially the IR and ear, internal and external rotation with arm by the side and 90 degree abduction and compare both sides. That is very important. Once you have done all these, then after the prep and grip, the next important thing is the portal placements. In Bankart's repair, there are three important portals to talk about. The standard posterior portal, which as you know, is about a thumb's width below and medial to the angle of acromion. <clears throat> then the superior portal or the antero superior portal, which is actually just uh, in front of the anterior border of the acromioclavicular joint. And internally speaking, it is in the rotator interval just in front of biceps. I will show you later. And then the anterior portal, which the landmark is about a thumb's breadth lateral to the midpoint of the coracoacromial ligament. Midpoint between the coracoacromial, the thumb's breadth lateral to that is the entry point for the anterior portal, which again internally goes to the rotator interval. There are also other less used portals like the five o'clock or seven o'clock portals, but they are not generally necessary. So before we come to the uh, actual portal placement, I'll show you something. If you imagine this is your uh, glenoid, flat line when the patient is in a lateral position. And there are two important tendons. One is the long head of biceps. You can see the inferior picture also. And this is the subscapular tendon. You can see it here also. So these two tendons with this glenoid inferiorly make a almost triangle. The superior portal that we are talking should come through this angle between the long head of biceps and this glenoid. And the anterior port should come through this portal at that angle of these two tendons so that you have much vertical access to the anterior glenoid face. And this one should give you a good access right up to the lower border of the thing. And remember, this triangle is basically the rotator interval, the space free of any rotator uh, uh, tendon. So now we'll show you how. So what we do is first, you put a needle through this. You can see this is the biceps tendon, this is the subscapularis, inferiorly this is the glenoid, and the middle, uh, which is coming right through this angle, this is what we are doing. And once you have put the needle through that, and that should be reaching the inferior most part of the glenoid, and then you put the second needle, which is through the apex, as I have told you, right to the top, you can see that, right? So these two needles, once they are put, then following them, you make a cut using a, a number 11 blade and using dilators, you develop the space and put the pores. So once you have done these two things, now you are ready to have a look inside the diagnostic arthroscopy. The idea is to fill the anterior labrum, their laxity, and detachment from the glenoid margin, also through the glenohumeral ligaments, then any glenoid bone defect, and then you also see the uh, rotator cuff tendon, as you can see here, 
when you look at the Hillsack solution, as you can see here, and then finally you go come to the axillary pouch. You look at the uh, axillary pouch also, and that completes your general diagnostic arthroscopy. And at the end of this, you decide uh, with the planning of the treatment for this patient, if you still decide, yes, you like to go ahead with the Bantard's repair, then is the next thing. Uh, we'll come to that. But before that, you can also have a view from the top, that is from the superior portal. You can have a look at the glenoid that gives you a much better uh, view of the whole of the lower part of the glenoid. But there are many people including myself, who continue to operate from the posterior port, continue to see from the posterior port, and uh, use our instruments from the superior or anterior port. So next step is the preparation of the glenoid margin, where you use a liberator or a long periosteal elevator to release the anterior capsulolibral tissue, which are quite often attached further medially down the glenoid neck. Very careful, don't damage them, just gently tease them from the anterior glenoid neck and release it completely so that they float to the level of the glenoid margin. You can see it here. They should float to the level of the glenoid surface. And once you have done that, you can also see they should be mobile enough using a grasper, you should be able to pull the capsule further up and proximally, which would be useful during your repair. And now you basically what they call dusting of the neck of the glenoid uh, using a shaver, uh, some people using a bar also, but I never, I use only a shaver to remove the, the connective tissues, fibrous tissues that were there in front of the glenoid so that the newly stitched uh, capsule will feel better. Once you have done that, now is the time for placing the first anchor. This is one of those so-called fast stack anchors, one of my favorites, one point of time, because you don't need a drill, you can pull them, push them directly through a uh, sleeve, you pull them, push them into the correct position. And once the anchor is placed, now also, of course, we use mostly all suture anchors. Then you take a bite into the capsule using different instrumentations you can use. I'm using a clever hook here, one of those anti-grade instruments. And you take a bite to the capsule in the appropriate place and uh, grab the uh, one limb of the uh, placed inferior anchor. And once that is taken, then uh, you actually apply an arthroscopic knot. And the idea is to pull the capsule up proximally and also take up any lag in the anterior and anterior inferior capsule. So this is how what we have done. There are also other methods to take this bite using what is known as a crescent hook or one of those suture hooks where you take a bite through the inferior part and through these hollow hooks, the, there is a shuttling uh, thread or shear, whatever you want, and through which you can take the uh, suture of the anchor through the capsule, completing your capsular bite. It's your choice. So once you have taken the first and the most in, in important bite, now is the time to place further anchors. And keeping this is the first anchor, so I'm going back to the previous patient again. Now we are putting the second anchor uh, about uh, reasonable distance away from the first one. Put the anchor, same story. And then uh, you have to take a bite using either a suture hook or one of those clever hooks, whichever you prefer. And once you have taken the bite, then you uh, complete your uh, suture, uh, complete your tie your knot, and you can keep on doing until you feel the whole of the uh, liberal tear has been repaired. Generally, people go up to 
2.30 or 2 o'clock and they use about three or four anchors, three most of the time for me. Once this has been down, now is the time to have a final look. A final look, you can see this is the lowermost anchor. This is the second, this is the third. They're all visible nicely. You can see this is the lowermost anchor, second and third. You look and they are forming a nice bump there. And you will also see that the tension of the glenohumeral ligaments have been restored. And with this, your operation is uh, the arthroscopic bankers repair is completed. So in conclusion, the most important things are Can't hear you, Devashish. Hello. Hello. Yes. Audible, yeah. audible, audible yeah. now. So, in conclusion, the final thing is the correct portal placement, which is important. Otherwise, you will struggle to do the job. Then, appropriate diagnostic arthroscopy and decision making is important because not every case may be managed by bankers repair. So your diagnostic arthroscopy and findings and their analysis gives you the correct decision. Adequate capsulolabral release is very, very important. That will give you a very good proper marginal repair. And then correct anchor positioning starting with the most important one right at the bottom. As they say, that is where you earn your money. And lastly, Remember about that proximal capsular shift and tightening of the lats capsule, but not too tight, of course, is the key to success. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Devashish, for the wonderful demonstration of a bank card surgery that we uh, all should be learning to do properly. Now, may I invite Dr. Yap Williams, our good friend from Amsterdam. Yap has been teaching us and helping us initially with his own uh, sideshow, as well as helping us the ISA course, right from the early part of 2000 of this, of this millennium. And he helped us with the first meeting that we did in, in Kolkata in 2006. Yap has been the president of European Shoulder and Elbow Society, has been a leading arthroscopic surgeon and a shoulder surgeon of Europe for many, many years. He has trained a large number of uh, surgeons from India, uh, two of whom I remember very well, Vivek from uh, Manipal and Kalyan from Calcutta, and has always been a helping hand whenever we wanted him. He now works out of Amsterdam as well as in uh, Abu Dhabi, I think, Yap? That's correct, yes. Okay. So uh, may I invite Yap to Come on, for, for, come on stage. Now, the way, way we are going to do is we are not going to keep Yap and uh, Jean sitting for too long. So as soon as they finish their talks, we, as, with, uh, we will start an interaction on how the European and the Indian scenario works. Uh, up, um, up to you, Yap, now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Kanshan. Thank you so much, uh, Samantha. It is really a pleasure to see uh, all through this uh, through Zoom many old friends, and I feel so very lucky that just prior to the corona, we could meet in, uh, at a wonderful CAS meeting in uh, Kolkata last January. It was yes. really a joy. And once again, I learned a lot from you there uh, as well. Well, let's proceed. We go to talk on the <coughs> remplissage. <coughs> Sorry for my noise, <coughs> my voice. <coughs> And um, well, I'm uh, debating, uh, putting in a question immediately. What is a non-engaging health sex lesion? I don't believe there is a non-engaging health sex lesion. All health sex lesions engage when you have a redislocation. So I think it is a little bit of the geography, if this horizontal or vertical, as Raju very nicely showed, that basically when you have a redislocation, a uh, health sex engages. But that is uh, a side way. Long time ago, it was, has been discovered already, the hill sex lesion, but for some reason, it has never been very important for us in the treatment since about 10 years. We were mainly dealing with the glenoid pathology, but the incidence is quite high. And if you include the arthroscopy studies, 
it is up to 100% if you have a uh, recurrent dislocation. It can just be chondral, which you don't see on X-ray, MRI, or CT scan, but it is really very, very often as shown here on the, on the left. Well, the size is important, and it's both important after the first dislocation, but also if you have done a soft tissue repair, the size of the hill sex plays a role in the chance of a recurrence. So size is important, but we still struggle how to measure the hill sex lesion. Is death important with the volume or location? All have been uh, investigated, but there is no really consensus how to do it. Well, I like to, 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 to pay attention to the width, which is also involved in the off-track uh, philosophy. We reviewed a series of 70 arthroscopy banquet repaired shoulders, 10 years for eight to 10 years follow-up. 84% had the clear hill sex lesion on the MRI or CT scan. And this is how I measured it, the width, taking the violet part as a percentage of the total width on the slice of the MRI where the hill sex lesion is the largest. Well, the cutoff point is the 25% of the width which you measured. Six out of the 70 shoulders had such a large defect, a large more than 25% of the width. And there was a significantly more chance of recurrence. So that was for me also the proof that the width can be helpful in detecting the importance of the hill sex lesion. Well, this has been already uh, discussed earlier. The Boileau uh, uh, classification is very helpful. And if you just take an X-ray, if it is visible on external rotation, you give it two points. So on an external rotation, it is a big lesion. Now, this is the glenoid tract discussed earlier. Well, I, I appreciate it. This method very much, it is very nicely evaluated, but we should aware that it is still a simplification of the problems. You know, when we have a hyperleg shoulder with a hill sex lesion, it is earlier engaging than with a very stiff shoulder. So a shoulder is not a mono actual joint. When we move the shoulder, it is both rotating as well translating over the glenoid. The human head is translating over the glenoid. So it can help, but I would warn that it is not an absolute measurement in detecting the pathology of the shoulder instability. That is my concern a little bit. If you have a leg shoulder, it is more easily translating over the glenoid and earlier this defect is engaging here. If you have a very leg shoulder, it will more easily engage compared to a stiff shoulder. So that is my concern a little bit about the glenoid track. Well, these are basically the treatment possibilities of an hill sex lesion. It is a little bit outdated. It has been popularized by Weber from Switzerland. I think it is a more or less obsolete method. It is a non-anatomical solution for the problem of the bone defect in the humeral head. This is anecdotal try to, uh, to from, from anterior, try to redress the bone. And, uh, but it basically, I think this is not a very scientifically investigated. It is interestingly introduced by Gerber. If it enlarged effect, I will come to that a little bit later. But that is now so much popular, the Ramplissage technique. Connolly was the first to discuss it. He did an open transfer of the infospinatus to the sex defect. 14 out of 15 satisfactory. He described that he didn't see any limitation of rotation. Well, 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 you're, you're, well Wolf, Eugene Wolf, you probably all are uh, knowing him. He introduced the arthroscopic method. He did in his first two reports, he discussed 20 patients, 18 were good and excellent. It, it was combined with an, of course, with an arthroscopic banker. But he did not discuss the limitation of rotation in his series. Well, if you look to the anatomy, <clears throat> this is the infraspinatus, and this is the infraspinatus, and there we have a putri anchor. So I don't think it is a tenodesis, it is a capsulodesis. If you just stick to the capsule, quite, quite often you involve the muscle 
uh, fixing it into the defect. So it is not a tenodesis, it is more or less a capsulodesis and a musculodesis that we should be aware of. Well, on the first series, Barlow, uh, showing it at the meeting in Edinburgh, um, he, did, he did see a limitation of external rotation, not in uh, internal rotation. Um, I would quickly go to the study of uh, Vivek Pandey from Manipal. <clears throat> he did a very nice study, but he showed that the patients with an remblissage both have an internal and an, and an external rotation deficit. Not big, but it is definitely present. This is the systematic review. Two, uh, in 2014, there's a low complication rate. They did not see in that series a significant loss of at external rotation. They did not define the exact number, but there is a little bit of loss, but not significant, and the results are comparable. And here, Longo and review lower recurrence compared to banquet repair alone. But definitely in all the series they reported on in this systematic review, was poor reporting on differences in pre and post operative uh, external rotation. And I will be happy to discuss with you what your experience is in the loss of rotation in the Ramprisage method. But basically, my algorithm, that is a personal algorithm, that is not the European algorithm, but uh, I, especially since there have been studies that this is basically the cutoff point for doing a bone repair. If it is less than 10 to 15 percent renal defect measured with the PICO method and supposedly on track, I do an just an arthroscopic label repair. If there's a large hill sex with a small bony glenoid defect, which is quite rare, I do an arthroscopic labrum and remplissage. And a larger defect, more than 10 50 percent, my threshold. Is that is to do a bone procedure, either a lapage or an either crest bone graft, whatever I choose for. And the large glenoid defect and the large hill sac defect, like an epileptic and chronic dislocation, I do a filling of the hill sex and the glenoid defect, like shown here, is an epileptic patient, large, and I use a humeral head or a femoral head allograft to fill the defect uh, in this defect. But that is a, quite a rare, rare indication. Well, a little video on the technique, right shoulder, white hill sex defect, labrum lesion, a little bit of chondral lesion. There's not a very big glenoid defect. I look, I put my cannula over the biceps tendon so I can still use my 30 degree scope. I have a very good vision here on the posterior part <clears throat> of the humeral head. Putting in normally two anchors, Percutaneously, I don't use a cannula for this, just percutaneously. I use, this is a twin fix anchor of Smith and Nephew, 5.5 or 4.5. It's hard bone, so you should prepare the hole. Percutaneously using a different portal through the skin, the same portal and then passing at a different place taking in the second suture and having all my eight strands. Then I do my labor repair. So I do my labor repair after passing the sutures. And at the end, I tie the sutures, filling the defect. If you do this in the beginning, it makes the labor repair a little bit more difficult. So basically first passing all the sutures here, then do the labor repair. And at the end, tying the sutures with the muscle or tendon and the capsule and outside and, and under the deltoid outside the infasminatus tying the sutures. That's it, basically a short note on the remplissage. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was very wonderfully done. So we have another small talk on remplissage by uh, Roshan was going to give us an Indian perspective of it. So once Roshan is done, we'll come back to the panel discussions on this so far, and then uh, Dr. Kenny will speak. So may I invite Dr. Roshan Wade, who was the ex-secretary of uh, uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society, a very dynamic person who's uh, the founder member of the Arth Arthro Arthroscopy Academy, 
and they hold a meeting every year, which is very well represented, very well attended. And may I invite Dr. Roshan Wade, please? Roshan, we can see your laptop, but cannot hear you yet. Somebody need to unmute me now. Can you we hear can me? hear you now. Okay, thank you. So, thank you very much, Dr. Kanchan, Dr. Swanindo, and Debashish for holding a wonderful uh, meeting on shoulder and shoulder instability. Uh, my name is Dr. Roshan Wade. I'm from Mumbai. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Yapildam. He's a wonderful teacher. I learned my first shoulder arthroscopy from him when he, came, he was in Mumbai in 2000, uh, 2003. That time I started learning shoulder arthroscopy. He was one of the IS faculty, invited faculty for 2003 IS from in Mumbai. Thanks, Yak, for your uh, contribution to my shoulder practice. So I'll, I'm going to speak in the voice more today. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So the uh, hill sacks, the description was described in, way back in 1940. However, the significance of his insects came in light when in 2000, year 2000, a, re a research produced by Dr. Jody, Jody Bear and Steve Burkhardt came in picture. And that shown that the uh, failure in a shoulder surgery, especially shoulder instability surgery, are related to the bone loss in the glenoid side as well as in the humeral side. It's easy way to tackle the glenoid bone loss. It's not that easy to tackle the humeral head bone loss. So that is why the, uh, they introduced the concept. Eugene Wolf introduced the concept of filling in. That is to fill in defects so that you can create a very good anchor for the infraspinatus and that will make the uh, lesion extraticular. However, this concept of this, uh, this uh, hill sacks lesion was described in way back in 1940. However, the impression of the instability was not uh, known. And the contribution of hill sacks lesion to glenohumeral instability completely depends on the size, orientation, and location of the defect. However, if the impaction factor of this uh, dense cortical glenoid bone onto the posterior superior part of the humeral head and giving anterior glenohumeral dislocation of the shoulder joint is known to be a major cause of recurrent dislocation. And this was known for many, many years. However, the prevalence of this hill sacks region was not very common in first time dislocators. Probably we didn't see it or we didn't understand it, but in recurrent dislocation, it is, it, its, its prevalence is as high as 95%. And certain studies have shown that there's a direct correlation between the uh, anterior instability or recurrent instability of shoulder with uh, the hill sacks region. The understanding as I told you, the, mo the, the most research uh, came after the year 2000 when Sue Bakard Jody Bear produced a wonderful paper on bone loss in instability. And this instability could lead to a recurrent or engaging non engaging hill sacs. This non engaging or engaging hill sacs will lead to a recurrent instability. Johnny Jaikombo, I'm very grateful to him. He shared this uh, small uh, uh, animation which describes. How the hill sacks lesion is created because of impaction of the humeral head onto the dense cortical bone in the glenoid. Once you have the impact of this, it leads to a recurrent instability because of loss of arc, which they described in their off track and on track lesion. So, once the engaging hill sacks lesion were described, the long axis of defect parallel to the anterior glenoid will lead to a major problem in abduction and external rotation position in the shoulder and sudden loss of articular arc from the humeral head will lead to an un uneasy sensation or instability. This is what a description in year 2000. Now we are 20 years beyond that. So what is the confirmatory dynamic test? The confirmatory dynamic test for all your lesions is basically whether it's an engaging or non-engaging. The only way to confirm this defect is by doing the arthroscopy. You put your arthroscope in and then you try to maneuver your shoulder in abduction and external rotation position so as to see the hill sacs is whether engaging into the anterior glenoid room or not engaging. The glenoid bone loss increases the risk of uh, a bank heart failure because there is a translation, the glenoid bone loss on the anteriorly plus the, 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 glenoid, uh, the humeral head bone loss lead to the additional instability. 
there are multiple previous studies were related to engagement and non engagement of insect region which ignoring the interactions however the uh, one blinoid track concept which was popularized by yamamoto and then uh, again uh, studied by dr giovanni jacomo from italy they found out that there is a, a, a good hypothesis to say that the hill sac region are potentiated by glenoid bone deficiency which will lead to increase in the hill sac engagement or on track off track lesions which they described in their article static effect the fan effect was again described by giovanni jacobo where he says that once you have a hill sac region there is a continuous pressure of the glenoid because of the muscles around the shoulder joint which will lead to additional hill sac region in future uh, dislocation so once you have a dislocation a repeated dislocation will lead to a static fan effect which will lead to a uh, more and more glenohumeral bone loss or humeral bone loss especially and they describe this as a medial hill sac and lateral hill sac depending on the bone bridge raju described it as a bone bridge between the uh, the uh, rotator interval the attachment to the rotator cuff and the uh, and the glenoid side so once you analyze this as the uh, off track lesion as raju had described it uh, 83% of your glenoid track which is articulating with the humeral head then it leads uh, it, it becomes off track lesion is there any arthroscopic measure because we are surgeon we can't understand that radiological technique there is a arthroscopic technique which can lead to lead you to the muscles where you can see the rotator cuff the footprint of the rotator cuff and there is a some bone breach a very small bone breach that means this is a lateral hill sac and this lateral hill sac will have a better outcome when you do a ramplissage as regards to the medial hill sac so how do you analyze this glenohumeral or hill sac lesion in your regular clinical practice the best way is to you have know, to uh, formulate something known as hill sac index the hill sac index is basically the uh, width of the hill sac minus the bone breach between the rotator cuff and to the uh, tuberosity if your hill sac index is hill sac index is more than 22 it becomes a medial hill sac and then you have a worse outcome so the measurement of glenoid tract is very difficult nowadays the radiologists are getting trained in doing this glenoid tract uh, measurement however hill sac index is very easy you can see this a 20 uh, mm is the deadline for your glenoid uh, hill sac femoral uh, insect index then there is a engaging and non engaging hill sac lesion so this concept of again uh, jody bear was the one who popularized it uh, does all the hill sacs engage not necessarily they, some hill sacs do engage but some never engage as as you can see here the non engaging hill sacs although there is a humeral head bone loss or compaction fracture of the humeral head due to poor primary dislocation it is not stretched enough to cause the continuous engagement of this hill sacs in clinical practice poscore bulu popularized his ic score and depending on this ic score this algorithm for was used for years lately in 2012 the america uh, to, uh, to, uh, 2020 in ajsm dr giovanni published his own score where he takes in consideration on track of track uh, concept however it's not been in clinical practice of late ic score was used where you have can decide if there is no bone loss directly you can go to arthroscopic bank card if you have isolated humeral bone loss you can do a hill sac along with uh, bank card along with ramp sac if it is isolated bone loss on glenoid you can directly go ahead with either arthroscopic bank card or latarge if it is combined always go ahead with latarge so it's a very 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 simple algorithm for your clinical practice whenever you are going to do so let's understand something some principle about the hill sac lesion if, uh, the hill sac lesion is basically making the lesion extra articular by doing a, a capsular tenodesis or tino capsular disease of intraspinal tendon into the lesion and this is right. where, where hello 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 can hear you we can hear you there is uh, somebody was talking yeah yeah so tino capsular disease of the infraspinatus muscle was done in hill sac lesion and this lesion will making the lesion extra articular and this very very described by pascal bolo in his paper where he shown very high success rate with, with this kind of procedure so this is the ramplissage which we do in our clinical practice sorry so this is the ramplissage we do in clinical practice you have to place an anchor as close to your uh cartilage region so that you can make it extra articular then you can pass your uh, suture material through your uh, the infraspinatus tendon or the muscle 
to cause the tenodesis. So basically, you have to fill that defect with the help of muscle or tendon so as to cause the tenodesis effect. There was uh, opposition to uh, this kind of technique with some of the researchers. They they cried about loss of range of motion, and there was a criticism about uh, weakness in the shoulder strength. But there are enough literature which is published in current uh, articles. Which shows that there is no gross loss range range of motion except for five to seven degrees extension, which may not be that difficult to recognize in your clinical practice, especially if the patient is very very high level of sportsman or thrower. Uh, there is a prospective and comparative randomized radiological trial to prove that ramplicis has got more better effect in your uh, in your range of motion and than excessive loss of range of motion. Loss of power and strength again was again uh, put forward, but there are enough paper to suggest that there is no gross loss of range of motion uh, or range of power in infraspinatus as well as teres minor, so that you can easily do your uh, capsular tenodesis or myo tenodesis. Damage to infraspinatus tendon was again uh, told by many researchers since you are going to pierce in four uh, direction at four level in the tendon, there could be damage. But again, the potential damage was again ruled out, and damage to the strain was not considered in clinical practice. Recently, the failure and prevalence of this uh, ramplicage technique has gone very high, as told by Dr. Jap uh, Williams, and the loss of external rotation is negligible, and there is no significant limitation of range of motion even if you do a good ramplicage. So, why there is improvement in good results as far as ramplicage? Because we have changed our indications. And disparity in anchor points. Somebody has to understand that if you don't do a right procedure, you may not get a right result. So, the change in the anchor points and change in indication has led to a very good result with uh, the uh, hills, uh, the management of hill sacs or engaging hill sacs problem in shoulder instability. So, this is uh, one more uh, clinical diagnosis of glenohumeral uh, 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 instability, which you can diagnose it clinically. But once you put your scope posteriorly, you will realize that you are dealing with a huge hill sacs, which will need some kind of attention in your clinical practice. Here you can see a completely engaging hill sacs, which is getting engaged onto the anterior cortical rim of the glenoid. And this will need some kind of attention when you are planning the bank card repair. So arthroscopic bank card repair with an amplicide was uh, tried by many researchers. Out of Pascal Bolo has shown wonderful result with as high as 60, 68%, 78%, 70% of his players going back to the free injury status. And that is very significant. So why do you need ramplissage when you want to do the... If you do only bank card, you may not be able to create a checkering effect. So what it creates is a wonderful checkering effect. It centralizes the head onto the glenoid. That is very important for a perfect functioning of the rotator cuff, the supraspinatus tendon. Unless you have the glenohumeral joint articulated on the center of rotation of the uh, uh, glenohumeral joint, you cannot get a stable joint. There has been a many concept about anchoring point, and this lead to varied results of the uh, ramplissage. Because if you see the literature, is variedly completely divided upon the ramplissage uh, results of ramplissage. Some say it is good, some say it is bad. It all depends on where you're going to put your anchors. So if you can put anchors as close to the attachment of rotator cuff, you may not get the ramplissage or checkering type of effect. If you do it very close, you might get a very tight and painful situation. And if you do it in center, you might get a good effect, but the healing potential is very, very less. So understand this each position in detail. If you do it at one and two position, it is more like capsular demo disease because you are very close to the tendon. The knots are far from the joint on the bursal side. It is very, very safe, but, the pro but it's very less effective because you are not blocking the complete uh, exotic, uh, you are not exteriorizing the, the, the humeral head part, which is going to affect the glenohumeral range of motion, the very high recurrent rate. That is why it's not been popular. Capsulomyodosis, if you do it at three and four position, because you are going very close. In that position, you may not be able to take the tendon. You have to take some kind of muscles. Sometimes you might take the teres uh, minor muscle and that time is going to be very, very difficult because it's going to cause very, very painful uh, range of motion. The pain chances is very, very high. However, it has got very low recurrence rate and it's more effective. If you do it at this position, it is very, very effective. And if you do it at five o'clock position, that is center, which is commonly done in India with single anchor, 
there is narrow chance of filling which is described again described by young gorgi as a filling index of the uh, hill sacks legion and weak fixation strength so one has to understand it in great, great detail so ramply sarge although it's to fill one has to fill in total you can't just fill it some part of ramply sarge so as to get a wonderful result you cannot do that you have to do an extra uh, portal for that you can do an extra portal take good amount of infraspantus in the muscle or tendon and create a good ramply sarge effect so you have to debride it create it create a lesion like what devashi has shown for bankart lesion you have to create a bone bed and that bone bed should have good good healing there is a study by jinian park where he says the evaluation of arthroscopic ramply sarge by high resolution imaging they have shown a wonderful result if you do it with two anchors and you can get a, a complete fill so the arthroscopic ramply sarge is compared with the latarge by dr yangalvi and he he publishes results and they found out that a loss of external rotation in in ramply sarge is up to 10 degrees whereas loss of external rotation uh, of la, latarge is up to 8 8 degrees so one has to understand there is a a uh, loss of rotation in the latarge as well as the ramply sarge recurrence is in latarge as well as in ramply sarge but most important is complication as far as ramply sarge is concerned there is less complication rate as compared to the latarge so one has to understand the importance of the procedure what is important in ramply sarge is correct placement of anchor if you see this this is a incompletely incorrect position of the anchor onto the glenoid and this will lead to recurrence because it's been placed at angle although you can do a very wonderful type of ramply sarge repair it may not give you a very good result so let's discuss a case he is around 28 year old male who had a more than 30 time dislocation and this is his mri you can see a small bony bank cut in front as well as a good amount of hill sacks lesion which needs the proper diagnostic scopy so once you have to do diagnostic scopy you can debride the lesion as dr ya pillam has told you that first you do debride and place your anchor so unless you place your anchor you should not proceed with your bank cut repair if you do that you may not get enough space posteriorly so as to do the uh, ramply sarge at later time so first you have to debride the lesion place your anchor and then you move anteriorly to do a complete bank cut repair so then you can do a complete bank cut repair as you can see here uh, you can elevate it and just go fast forward and then you can do a complete bank cut repair as told by dr devashish a simple technique you can pass two or three anchor depending on the situation and you can complete your bank cut repair with the help of anchors and then you can go posteriorly so as to tie and create a capsular so debridement again is very very important and then you can see here a complete procedure again i will go fast because think, uh, yeah so this is how we can do it you have to pass the uh, anchors you can pass one or two anchor depending on the region usually i plus two anchors so that i can get a better hold of infraspinatal and then you can create a uh, then you can create a lesion so as to pass and create the uh, good amount of kenodesis inside the glenohumeral gland filling index has been described by dr yangalvi where he says that if you do a glenohumeral uh, capsular kenodesis in the the humeral head it has to have a good filling index unless you have a good filling index the results are not directly proportional so this filling index has been studied and they found out that if you do a two anchor kenodesis it has got better filling index and this can be easily studied in axial as well as sagittal plane of the humeral head when you are doing the post op mri so what are the other options to treat this kind of uh, hill sacks lesion the commonest one when you are dealing with bone lesions is a tricortical bone graft maybe disc or latarge type of procedure on the humeral side you can do osteochondroallograph which i don't have any experience ramply sarge who do it very common the open transfer i have done in few cases transhumeral head plasty i don't have any experience or rotational osteotomy even i don't have any experience so in summary there is change in indication as far as the instability surgeries are concerned to moderate to large hill sacks lesion you can do a more of glenoid procedure if it is more than 25% so that you can get a better anterior stabilization ramply sarge with bankart in engaging hill sacks will work it has got better outcome various results are according to the site of anchor insertion that is very very important and and uh, arthroscopic ramply sarge with posterior capsular kenodesis has got a high excellent ma maintenance and excellent re uh, less recurrence rate for shoulder instability thank you thank you roshan thank you roshan kanchonda you have to unmute yourself 
Right. Uh, thank you, Roshan, for the wonderful uh, presentation. So now it seems that we've got a surfeit of information about remplissage. So we will have Dr. Kenny speak to us later, but we'll ask him to get involved in the panel discussion that we now have on all that, all the talks that we've had. So we'll start first with the first talk by Dr. Vikas Kapoor on the uh, clinical and radiological uh, evaluation. Now, if somebody has any questions, please come forward. I have one question. Before you operate, Vikas, which other tests, physical, uh, physical examination tests that you carry out routinely to decide whether the patient needs surgery or not? The history is taken care of. We will go to the investigations later. But what specific tests do you do, which is a definite indication for you for surgery? Uh, the definite indication for surgery primarily uh, with a history of recurrent dislocation which we get uh, most of the times, and uh, is the apprehension and the anterior drawer test. Uh, these two tests uh, done uh, in conjunction, in sitting and in supine position, gives me a fair idea in OP practice, which is quite busy with so many people, to go about and find out what kind of uh, instability or what kind of uh, difficulty the patient is having. At a very minimal uh, uh, stress if we give and if the patient complains of apprehension and pain uh, well it's a it's a give way to understand in a in a frank instability where there is a lot of play between uh, the shoulder in the between the glenoid and the uh, humeral head we do get a bit of extra laxity but such cases i have found are not very painful cases so pain while these two tests during apprehension and the draw tests which we do are a kind of a regular OPD practice. Rarely uh, the O'Brien test or the test for AC joint also kind of, but it is a mixed picture which I think we get in these tests. And I can't really be sure for me to look at AC joint, direct pressure on AC joint gives me a fair idea of where the pain is. And if the direct pressure on AC joint is not very painful or it's not tender, then probably the slap or the superior labrum is playing up in the O'Brien test. Uh, just an admin, this is my view on it. We all, all the tests are positive. I generally follow three tests, which uh, immediately decide whether I want to do a surgery now or later. One is the apprehension, like you mentioned. The other is the relocation test. And the other is the release test. So what do the others think about their choices of uh, physical examination tests. Let's start with Dr. Kenny first. Jin, can you hear us? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I am with you. So oh, oh, could you could you repeat the question? It's about the clinical examination, which is my favorite test. Yes, yes. Uh, of course, uh, uh, but the, the, the most important for me, first of all, is the integration. When I question my patient, I know whether it's traumatic or not. This is the first point. The second point, of course, I am looking for the apprehension test. Of course, most of the time it is positive. But after the main time, the main examination for me is to look for hyperlaxity. Because when you have some hyperlaxity, you can understand why you have less uh, radiologic lesions. So hyperlax have no when we lesion most of the time, or hip succession, very small, and that guy has a traumatic case, has a significant bone So the most important is the trauma, second, uh, the apprehension test, and number three, hyperlaxity. Thank you, Jean. Now, um, yep. Yeah. Well, your key, yes. I, I agree with your three tests. Uh, um, apprehension, re relocation, release. You sometimes see patients that they say they have an unstable shoulder. But if you test them, these, these tests are negative. That's for me not an anterior instability. What I, as fourth test standard include, and is sometimes forgotten, is testing the posterior instability. There are quite some occult posterior instabilities. And well, the, the jerk test, uh, popularized by Kim from Korea, is in my hands uh, uh, very important compared to the posterior apprehension and other tests. 
the jerk test with the click and and subflux, uh, subluxation, a painful click and subluxation posteriorly is for me in indicative for posterior pathology. So these four tests are for me very important. Thank you. Of course, now, thank of you. course besides history and, uh, yes. and so on. So. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have Roshan. Yes, brother. Your favorite uh, physical examination test for deciding on surgery. I, I always do apprehension test because that is the one which is gold standard. And then I do uh, examination under anesthesia. Uh, whenever I'm taking patient under anesthesia, I will just examine his uh, mid-range of uh, instability. Because uh, I feel uh, clinical examination plus radiological examination will be a confirmatory test about the decision making in shoulder instability. Uh, there is no uh, magic test which will give you a 100% confirmatory result. But I think apprehension is the one which is more widely practiced and accepted as we go Right. Devashesh? Well, much the same. The most important is, of course, the apprehension, relocation, the hyperlaxity, and the range of movement rotations that we check for sure. Raju, any addition? Yes, the only thing that I'd like to add is that I check for shoulder hyperlaxity, which may be different from generalized hyperlaxity. Uh, they sometimes can't be correlated with each other. So the two tests that I most rely upon are the Jill Walsh test, that is the ability to passively externally rotate till the coronal plane, and the Gagey sign, that is the ability to passively abduct uh, the shoulder in the scapular plane uh, beyond 105 degrees. Uh, uh, Sean Indu. Yes, because I, I completely agree with you. Mostly the traumatic history and your apprehension and relocation test. And mm -hmm. that too, I do my all this apprehension in 0, 20, 30, and 60. I think because if, the, if it is yeah. more in 60, all this, yeah. Yes, the, here, the point is very important. What you are looking at? Are you looking at traumatic, unidirectional, bankart lesion? Or you're looking at Ambry because that is how your uh, clinical examination is going to change. If I think uh, we have all agreed on the fact that the history is going to be the first yeah. important. I think Kanchu sir asked about Kanchu sir asked about the traumatic, and we are dealing with traumatic dislocations yeah. only. Talking about, uh, talking I, about, I, I am wondering why we are not he, discussing. He, he asked about traumatic. Hello. Uh, you are not. You are. You are not audible because. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes. Now, now it is clear. Yeah, I was also wondering about this is all we are discussing in anterior posterior plane. How uh, would anybody respond to a suspicious uh, slap lesion where you are not getting something in anterior posterior plane? That's what yes, I there is a there is a talk on slap. If the time permits, I'll be taking on that. But thing is, is that part of the instability is yes, which yes, we sometimes, get in, uh, so. sometimes I put a small video on that. Sometimes your bank card is also associated with slap. And also, there is a new, uh, new is the extended classification of the Snyder one. Okay. Sometimes. Uh, well, well Biplop, you have any other tests that you do? No, no, no. Apart I from the ones that you have noticed? I do all the three tests, as you have mentioned. Simultaneously, I try to exclude the posterior dislocation and the multiaxial laxity. I first exclude all these two. Then I concentrate on the anterior dislocation and I do the all, all the three tests. Okay. My my question yeah. is Obik, Obik. so there are two uh, things i want to add one uh, is uh, identify patients with scapular dyskinesia even if they have dislocation of the shoulder is one point we all miss so uh, i do a examination of the scapula and all my patients are instability and i found a, quite a high number of patients with subtle and sometimes major dyskinesia which i would rather tackle separately or probably preoperatively the other thing is uh, so if you're dealing with a throwing athlete, I always examine the other shoulder. Always examine because each one of us has a different range of motion, different uh, uh, tissue structure. So I don't want to make my operative shoulder too tight for that. So the other shoulder gives me a slight idea, not too much, slight idea what his range of motion is going to be, uh, a little bit of idea for that. Yes, Jeff. Can I ask a question to Abik? Yes, yeah. yes. You are, you are there, yeah. Are, are you considering the scapular dyskinesia is a separate problem from the instability or might it be the, re the result of the instability avoiding some positions of the arm by having a different position of the scapula? 
So I have come across patients when scapular dyskinesia is leading to instability because mm -hmm. of the muscle imbalance, and they, uh, uh, the the patient does not have any structural damage. It actually leads to a instability. Yes, sir. And the other one is a lesion leading to a scapular dyskinesia. So there are two different issues. So if I have a primary scapular dyskinesia leading to a instability, then I would just treat the dyskinesia. And I have seen in a umpteen number of cases that the patient does not require surgery. But if there's a dyskinesia before uh, this, I would I would treat it or start the prehab, the prehab exercises, and then go for surgery at the same time. Uh, I think I can Abhi, add one thing. Abhi, yes. Abhi, Abhi, were, were this uh, primary dyskinesia with instability a traumatic one or the traumatic? These are usually micro traumatic ones, very subtle ones. Uh, and there are certain throwers will have that. You will have this in javelin throwers, you will have this in archers, you will have this in basketball players. Uh, so, any young guy, an athlete, always look for it. Okay, I think I think that that part of the sick. I think Jap is indicating work that the probably in the throwers and Ovik is also indicating that in throwers because of the uh, extreme range of abduction and external rotation, probably the pathology begins in the inferior anterior quadrant of the uh, your uh, labrum. Probably there you are talking of that micro trauma. Yes. Yeah. This is a this is a separate subset. This is yes, a separate yes. subset which is not, uh, I think it is about micro instability, which we are trying to detect. And we are suspecting that there may be a micro instability uh, after having examined a uh, scapular dyskinesia. So scapular dyskinesia, the patient comes with a problem, a painful shoulder. And there as a part of examination, we try to find out whether, whether there is a problem. micro instability or not. Yes. Not that the instability is contributing to the scapular dyskinesia. So I think it is the other way around. No, Abhik seems to have come no, across. No, the, the thing is not that. The thing Abhik. is these subset of patients, uh, we, we are talking about clinical examination. So my point was that we should all add, I, I don't know how many of you do actually do a scapular examination in an instability patient. In a, yeah. I think we just do the two, three apprehension. There's, yeah. We just forget about it. Now, ever since I've started doing the full examination, stripping them and seeing the scapula, I've found these patients and not, at least 10% of these patients have avoided surgery just by identifying a scapular dyskinesia, treating that dyskinesia first. And many of them actually have not required surgery. I was speaking to Suman Krishnan also about it. And he was saying that, I mean, I've been trying to say this to everybody. And this is such an important thing that you touched it. Abhi, I, I have a concern. I have, I have one concern, Kanchanda. Yes. Uh, the concern is that, uh, concern is that in a patient with a scapular dyskinesia, with a Bankart lesion, would you just treat a scapular dyskinesia? No, we are going to that later. What we are yes. talking about is physical examination. And I agree with the Obik in the fact that with all the investigation, all the tests that we do, and a lot of them are similar, that none of us have mentioned scapular dyskinesia as one of the tests that needs to be done. And he feels that that should be done. And oh, I think, okay, okay. think about okay. it also. Yes. We need to think about it also. Point we have come to the second. next lecture of uh, Raju. Now, the first question that comes to my mind is, Raju, you seem to have indicated that for you, CT scan is a better imaging modality than MRI. Am I correct in doing that? Or yes, you I would. Uh, if the patient comes primarily to me, I would probably not get an MRI done uh, unless I feel it might add significant information. Uh, my preferred modality would be a CT, provided the plain X-rays... Uh, and the history, uh, both these information, they give me something that uh, the patient may have a glenoid or a humeral head bone loss. All right. Now, among the other, the other uh, people participating, who normally wants CTA as a primary modality? I agree with uh, Raju in getting a good uh, AP view and all my patients have a burner show view. Uh, but among the others, among the CT and the MRI. All right, I see Biplob here. Biplob, what is your choice, CT or MRI? CT, CT. I, I was trained with the CT. That's why right. I'm... French trained, so it's CT. Obek has left. Obek is not here. All right. Now, yes. Vikash? I CT would do an MRI. MRI. With an X-ray, yeah. With an X-ray. X-ray is there, so... We, yeah, of course. Here on MRI. The, the which you mentioned. MRI and CT, both. Both. 
No, the, it's the primary choice, the first choice. Then comes CT. That's of, me, of course, is MRI yeah. to establish the bank soft tissue lesion, to establish associated soft tissue pathologies. I'll get a rough idea of existing, coexisting bony lesions from there. And I will, of course, want a CT after that. So you want an MRI and the CT both? Yeah. Uh, Shonandu? Unless this, I, I suspect that there is a bony loss in my clinical and x-ray, I don't go with the CT scan primarily. It's always MRI. All or right. Only if I want to evaluate my bony loss, then only I do the CT. All right. Uh, Roshan? I do CT as well as MRI both because I want to be sure all the way. So and CT and yeah. MRI both? Yes. All right. Always. Uh, yeah. Unmute Jack, please. Can you unmute? As I disc er discussed earlier, I do standard X-ray and uh, MRI arthrogram. If I'm not happy with my MRI sagittal view on the bone defect, I include a CT scan. But quite rare because it is uh, young patients, a lot of radiation. I try to avoid it. Jean? Uh, I prefer I prefer the CT scan. I don't like the MRI, sorry for, for to disagree with my friends. I prefer CT scan because, as you said, uh, it's better to analyze the bone loss, first of all. And you will see in my presentation, my decision making for is based on the CT scan and the bone loss. The second point is I prefer the CT scan because you have more slides, uh, about 200, 300 slides. And in comparison with the MRI, you just have 16 slides. So if you want to look at very small lesions, uh, I think the CT scan is more precise than the MRI. So I prefer the CT scan. And a question for you, Jean. In your practice, what percentage of the patients do you do an arthroscopic bank cart with or without remplissage? And what percentage do you do a bony pr procedure like a letter J? Yes, thank you for your question. I will answer in my presentation with a very nice evolution of my experience during the last 10 years. 10 years back, I've performed about 90% of bank art plus remplissage. But today, I perform 90% of arthroscopic lethargy. And I will show you why I decrease my indication of uh, soft tissue procedure uh, in comparison with the uh, Okay. Right. So we yeah. can go, go ahead. Okay. No, I think we finish the remplissage, then we come because we've got two talks of remplissage. There has to be some talk on remplissage. Yeah, yeah. Um, ja, uh, um, sorry, yeah. What percentage of your patients do you do arthroscopy, bank card, plus minus remplissage? You've given us the percentage of the bone loss, but in the real number of patients, what percentage go to bank um, a bony procedure and what percentage goes to a soft tissue procedure? Yeah, well, it is about 30-40% uh, uh, banker to with or without remplissage and about 60-70% bony procedures. Roshan? I got around 20-30% to 30 remplissage and rest all is plain banker. I don't do uh, arthroscopic lethargy, uh, but I do open lethargy. What Very percentage well, of your patients undergo lethargy? Yeah, open lethargy is around uh, 10%. Not more right. than that because we but, don't get that contact patients, okay. unnatural, unnatural games contact patients. <clears throat> Our patients are very, very uh, profiled. Devashish? Well, I'm 10 years behind Jean Kenny. I'm still 90% soft tissue and 10% bony. All right. Because? Yeah, I think we, the 90%. Percent of my instabilities are addressed soft by tissue. yeah soft tissue reconstruction. Shonandu? Yes, my 70-80% are all been soft tissue. Hardly 10-20% is already only on latter J. Because our, as uh, uh, Roshan told, our patients are not there, that go to that sort of contacts. All right. And make some safe distance. Abhik? 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 Abhik has disappeared. He's not there. Yeah. Um, Big love. Uh, it's 50 50. I take decision on based on IS score, and now I am following the city based IS score to make the final decision. It's so 50 50. 
50-50. Well, we'll go on to Dr. Kenny's talk, but just before that, I have a small aside here. Year before last, I was in a meeting in, in uh, uh, Madurai and an elderly surgeon who, you know, we grew up in an area where there were lots of different surgeries for anterior dislocation, which include lateralization of subscapularis in different forms. And then we had the Bristol, and then we had the osteotomies, and then we had the void chair. And then now we have different tests to figure out. And this, this gentleman asked me a question, which makes me wonder. He said, you know, we, we, we did all those surgeries earlier. And my good friend, Dr. Bakshi, that gentleman said, he did boy chip, which is a sling operation at, with good results. Now, today we are talking about a lot of letter J. So if you're going to do a lot of letter J, why do we have to spend so much money in doing MRI and CT scan? Why can I not just go and do letter J in all of them? Like you know, Kandis, a lot of uh, people in France do. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Yes, but you have to justify. You have to justify your operation. How much yes. your bank? How yes, yes, yes Jeff. This is food for thought. You also yes. have to justify doing MRI and CT scan. A lot of patients who've been in the U.S. refuse to get a CT scan done because of the radiation. So and I would the, agree with your concerns, Doctor Kanchan. And uh, this was uh, what I faced in the initial years of my practice. Uh, senior colleagues would uh, tell that my boy chairs and my letargies do so well, the shoulder doesn't dislocate at all, and uh, your bank out operation is so expensive. And uh, in the initial part of the learning curve, there are a certain percentage of recurrences. And uh, I, I, this is a valid concern. Most of the senior men have uh, done a very good letargy procedure in their uh, residencies, and the patients are doing well. Well, I was, I was involved in this voyage of procedures under Dr. Bokshi during my PG days and our results we published in uh, Seacord Journal Seacord, you know. and they appear, appeared pretty good. I also did a lot of voyage. I never saw a re recurrence. So? so? I also did a lot of voyage. I, I did my... I then why, do you, why do you bother to change? <laughs> See, it, it, it's interesting when you look at all these sling operations, Bristol, Letter J, Boy Chef, they were all kind of done for the first time at about the same period, late 40s and early 50s. Okay, I think we Say should hear something about Jacques Kenny. I invite Dr. Jacques Kenny to tell us about Letter J. Dr. Jacques Kenny is from Toulouse, France, a very renowned surgeon. He's helped us several times. He is renowned for his muscle transfers and his. Uh, contribution to uh, shoulder replacements as well. Uh, do, do you see my screen? Yes, Dr. Kani, we see it so well. Okay, so, so thank you a lot, uh, Kanshan. Thanks a lot, Samantha, for your kind invitation. And uh, it's a debate, it's great after two months of uh, rest to too long period. Um, I will talk about arthroscopic lethargy indication and complications, but uh, I will tell you why, as I told you just a few minutes ago, I stopped uh, quite totally soft tissue procedure. Uh, I am a my tech consultant, but my choice of lethargy do not, does not depend on my uh, consulting. So as you know, I am living in Toulouse, which is the city of Airbus industry, and here is the number of cases I do. Uh, shoulder to toe lateral pass 400 and 100 lethargy or 73 procedure a year and about 40 arthroscopic lapsus dorsi. That means my experience is about eight shoulders a year. Uh, if you go back in the story, you can see that the arthroscopic bank card and the poem with the bank card is the recurrence of the instability. And we have progressed a lot since many years, since Morgan, to the anchors and the rate of recurrence is about 11%. Uh, but you have to remember that uh, bone block, the rate of recurrence is only 3%. So this is the main difference. If you look at these papers, after two to five years of follow-up, you can see that uh, the rate of recurrence after an isolated bone graft is 9%. And if you Wait in time, if you follow the publications between 2006 to 2009, the rate of failures and recurrences after isolated bank acts was 12.5. That means it's not because you become better, or it's not because 
you have a better technique, but you decrease the rate of recurrence. The problem is somewhere else. This is the study of the French uh, society in 2013. And uh, we, we have realized that if you wait eight years after your bank art repair, isolated art speed bank art repair, the rate of recurrence is not 11%, but 25%. So there is a question. Why do you have so many recurrences after an isolated bank art in France, of course, but somewhere else too? So as you know, Wolf uh, and Connolly have imagined the remplissage and have imagined something else and have called this the artistic bipolar fixation. And I've developed that with my friend from Bangalore Hemant Kumar and Raj Kumar and Navarati. So you can see that it's a little different because I do not make the remplissage into the heel sacs, but my fixation is lateral onto the bare area just to rebalance the sugar. And I don't want to damage the muscle, the, the muscle baby. So uh, I've done this technique a lot during 2009, 10, 11, and 12. And you can see that in green, it is the bipolar fixation, that means soft tissue procedure, and in white, the open lethargy. And you can see that about 80 to 90% of my experience at this time was soft tissue procedure alone. But unfortunately, after one year, you can see here 3% of failures, after two years, 6% of recurrence, after four years, I have, like everybody, 11% of failures. That means if you wait uh, eight years, I'm sure that this failure rate will be close to 25%. And I, I consider that it's impossible to accept that. After one year, the result is very good. After four years, it's not very good. And after eight years, it's very good. So why for us? Uh, the artistic bank art procedure or soft procedure can fail. I think probably we have under, underestimated the significant bond loss, and probably we can underestimate the stop tissue lesion, and we are going to try to understand. It's very difficult. First of all, uh, I read paper from Shugaya. You know that Shugaya described uh, in 2003. 50% of problem type into the glenoid and 40% of erosion or attrition type. And that means for Shugaya, you have 90% of glenoid defect, 90%, it's a lot. Uh, take, 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 take a look at this example. It's a CT scan, just an axial slide. You can imagine that it's a not, there is an injection, you can imagine that it's a very small lesion because there is a small bank at lesion. It was, a, it was a failure after a bipolar fixation. And you can see there is a very small uh, bone lesion. But if you take the same patient and you do the reconstruction, you can see that it's a very slow, small lesion, but very extend, uh, the length is very long. And if you measure the Gerber index, and to this morning, nobody have told talk about the Gerber index. For me, it's the easiest and the most precise uh, radiologic uh, index, you can see that it's a significant lesion and you don't have to stop your analyze regarding the axial view, you have to measure uh, an index. And of course, you know, this is the ISIS scored. And when you have uh, uh, a glenoid bone loss, you have very high risk of uh, a dislocation after an isolated bank gap. It's very easy to understand if you play golf, I do not play a lot of golf, but if you play golf, you know that if you have a green with lesion here, your ball can, cannot be stable and slide. And even if you try to repair something here, if there is a bone loss, it cannot work very well. So on another topic, uh, you have a heel sax lesion. And I totally agree with uh, my friend Jack, because in fact, it's more frequent than you can imagine. Uh, you, you can see different papers, and we are close to 100% in the case of recurrent dislocation. Uh, and I scores again have shown that in case of these such lesions, there is a high rate of recurrence. And it's very easy again to understand if you, if you play golf, 
you can see here, uh, it was a flat surface behind the board. It cannot be stabilized. It's the same with the, the kissing lesion. So this is the uh, court. I will not sum up that because everybody knows this, this is court. So I will, I will push on my presentation. But this is very interesting. If you follow Pascal Boileau and uh, the publications, you can see that when the IZ score is more than six, the rate of recurrence after, after an isolated bank of repair is more than 70%. If you have IZ score, IZ score less than three, the rate of recurrence is only 5%. But that means you can propose a classic isolated bank arts only in case of isolated revision when you have no bone lesion after 20, 20 years old and when the patient doesn't practice any uh, traumatic sport. So if you look at again into the uh, underestimated lesions, uh, Shugaya has shown that we have 90% of limb lesion and other publication has shown that there are close to 100 limb lesion. That means for me, if you follow these publications and the ISIS score, less than 10 persons of the patients are eligible for an arthroscopic bank art in my city. Um, of course, we are going to, we will talk about the Denry tract and uh, they, they, uh, they describe it all and uh, uh, they, they describe the, 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 the kissing lesion. But there is something else that is very important. There are soft tissue uh, lesions that, that are very difficult to understand. And we know, you know the other lesions. So what is, you, you think it's very rare, I'm not sure. Look at uh, these other lesions. Of course, it's difficult to see and very difficult to repair uh, because it's quite impossible for me, atroscopically, to put an anchor uh, at the neck of the, of the humerus. And if you do a bank art in that situation, you will. Uh, you will uh, create some uh, new lesions. So the, the, it's another lesion is very difficult to, to create, especially with uh, an atroscopic person. So everybody knows Michel Latarge, who published his paper in 1954. He was a surgeon from France. But we had to wait for Pat, DDA Pat, in 1980. And Pat really understood uh, how the Latarge can work because there is a bone block effect, because there is a slim effect, and because you have a capsuloplasty effect, a ligament effect stabilization. These are my three papers regarding my experience, and I will show you uh, some, some, some things, and especially my complications. Um, first of all, this is my uh, learning curve. You can see the operative time, it's published now, and you see uh, 50 cases here, you see 100 cases, and you can see 300 cases here. This is the time of my surgery, the operative time. That means you have to wait 30 to 50 cases uh, to, to be uh, comfortable with this technique regarding your operative time. And now for me, it's about 45 to 50 minutes, not more. Uh, positioning of your bone block. In fact, during the very beginning, these are my first 30 cases, and these are my cases after my uh, 70 case. You can see that you improve a lot your own technique uh, after uh, 50 cases. And now the positioning could be qualified as correct or quite perfect in 85% of my procedures. Uh, so it's not possible, sorry. It's not possible to, to, to vote, but uh, maybe next time it will be possible to, to, to quiz the panel. I would like to know whether you have or not complication with the Latange. So these are my complications. Uh, since 2010 now, so 10 years ago, uh, and more than 500 procedures, I did not have any vascular procedure. I just had one actual nerve palsy. It was a transitory nerve palsy, and I had three revisions, that means 2.8 percent, one infection, one malposition exclu, and one uh, very bad uh, positioning of my bone block. Uh, so it's not 14 person uh, like in the American uh, publications, it's only three percent. This is an example, after one month it was an infection, so I went again into my joints to understand uh, what happened to, to, to drain and to, to, to drain my, my shoulder, 
And you, you will see how is the bone block after one month. You, you can see this soft tissue. I did not need any bank after additional procedure, but you can see that uh, there is some, some capsule onto the bone block. The bone block is fine. So if you, if you make the drainage very quickly, you don't have the sterilizes, so you, you don't have any problem. This is, this is a, a, a key to, to remember. Uh, if you have any infection, do not wait because you may have a, a high complication like uh, uh, liposteolysis. But the problem of the positioning is not only because of an arthroscopic procedure. You look, look at these two papers over the years here on Alan. Uh, more than 50% of the positioning was not, were not perfect at this time. And this is the paper of Jill Walsh. And for Jill Walsh, with an open procedure, the positioning is not perfect in more than 20% of his cases. So what is the advantage of an arthroscopic procedure? For me, you can treat the combined lesion. You can make antisage. We talk about slap lesion. It's very easy to, to treat a slap lesion in case of combined lesion. You, you can treat a tough tear. You can make a bank out like Pascal Bradley if you want. I don't need to not do that, but I think it could be very interesting. And what about the running so, uh, very quickly, the, the timing is about uh, one hour and a half. And uh, with, after, after more than 100 procedures, it's becoming close to one hour. So what about the direction of the screw? Most of the surgeons are afraid, are afraid about the direction of the screw, the brachial plexus, because uh, Pascal Ballot called the medial portal as the suicide portal. For me, the suicide portal is not so hazardous. Why? Because if you play external rotation with your shoulder, with your scapula, so you will uh, increase the safety of your of your of your Krishna wire. You can see this is the publication of Philip Valenti, and you can see that uh, in neutral position, the Krishna wire is very close to the nerve. But as soon as you you put external rotation of your scapula. You have more than one, between one to two centimeters here. Uh, this is uh, uh, failed lethargy because of recurrence. So sometimes it can appear. Uh, you can see that uh, um, there is a, the, the bone block is at the right position, but it was a failure. So it was an open lethargy. It was not an arthroscopic lethargy. So it's possible to remove the screw if you want. Uh, and either you stop here the procedure, but you may have a recurrence of your of your of your instability. Then, if there is a bone loss, of course, I think it's a good indication for a kidney binet procedure. But you have, if you have no bone loss, you can make a, a capsular shift. So, so you can see that sometimes I do capsular shift. I, I do soft tissue procedure. Sometimes, in case of even in case of revision or lethargy, and this is my posterior amputation. So you can see it's a Bipolar fixation, it's very interesting to see this picture because I am not on two the muscle, I am on two the tendon. And this is very interesting to, to, to note the bipolar fixation is not exactly the same than uh, the, uh, the bunker plus amplissage because my anchors are more lateral. So now there is a, a better instrumentation to, 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 to help the beginners. I do not use it, but this is the question you asked me just previously. Uh, how many bank acts, how many bipolar fixations, and how many latage I do. Look at my progression the last 10 years. Uh, in green, you have a bipolar fixation. In white, it is open latage. In blue, it is arthroscopic latage. So I can tell you that now, in 2020, more than 90% of my procedure are arthroscopic latage out of close 1,000 total procedures between the last, uh, in the last 10 years. So in conclusion, when you have no glenoid lesion, that, that means when the CT scan is normal, for example, in the uh, hyperlax CT, yes, I propose a bipolar fixation. So I did definitely stop the isotic bank act. So I do either bipolar fixation, but this is less than 10% of my indication. And again, look at, it's not a remplissage. I just fix the bank act plus the, uh, the posterior capsule here. And on the opposite, when you have significant glenoid lesion, that means when the Gerber index is more than, uh, uh, sorry, when the Gerber index is significant, 
I do a lateral G plus or minus remplissage in case of epileptic procedure. And these are more than 90% of my indication. And I invite you at the next two shoulder course with Pascal Balou, Laurent Lafosse, and Philippe Valenti. We will make 24 hours of full surgery, non stop surgery. We're going to turn around the, the, the world with the sun, and every expert will play at home, will make his own surgery at home, if we, and we, he will have two hours to explain and to show. So thank you very much, my friends, and of course, I am here to, to discuss with you because I'm sure you disagree with me. Well done. Thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Wonderfully done. So, I think I'll start with Biplop. You got to get to ask questions from Dr. John Kenny because you do more letter J. You got fifty percent letter J. I do open letter J, sir. Doesn't <laughs> matter. Doesn't matter. No, still doesn't J. matter. But open and close, open and after, whatever you go, your so philosophy, you ask, thinking, philosophy thinking is uh, that way, no? That the fifty percent is, I think, you will be the probably close yeah. to the eighty percent of Jha. I got a question for Jha. Yes, yes. Yeah, the job's left. Job's left. Yeah, Jean, yeah, right. Jean Kenny, sorry. Right. Um, Jean, you said that basically, as you can, we, have, we all know, if there is an IC score of more than three, then the bankers, only soft tissue banker is a bit iffy. Is that right? Yes. Okay. In okay. that case, 10 years ago, you have been doing 90% soft tissue procedures and supposing at eight years you have got a maximum of 12 percent failure by your stats so a rest 70 to 80 percent did well yes so, or what so, 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 sorry uh, if it was uh, the sun was just you're right in fact the the failure uh, with bipolar fixation is about eight uh, Twenty percent, not more. It's not so bad, but with a bone block, it's only three percent. So the problem is uh, when I did a lot of soft tissue procedure, uh, and when I I follow my patient, I was always afraid about a recurrence at the very beginning of the of the consultation. And now, and sometimes I had failure, sometimes not. You're right. Some some patients are well, uh, are doing well. But when you do a, 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 a latarge, you never have, I never have this, uh, uh, this, uh, how yeah. apprehension. Yeah. Uh, this apprehension, yes, because I know all my latarge are well and the rate of complication is very few, very, very few. So, in, in finally, it's not very scientific, but I am more comfortable with the latarge because of a very, very, very low rate of recurrence. Okay. I have a question for you, Jean. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> I, have, I have a question for you, Jean. Yes. Uh, what kind of surgery were you doing in, like, say, 1999-2000 for shoulder dislocation? Could you repeat, please, my friend? What surgery were you doing for instability in the year 1999-2000-2001? The early part of your career? What 20 were you years ago. 20 okay. years ago. Oh, uh, okay. So between, uh, I've started my private activity in 2000. So right. from 2000 to 2004 or 5, I perform open lethargy. All cases? Oh, quite all cases. Because there, we, had, we had a very bad uh, experience with the isotic banker. Then as I developed the arthroscopic technique, I developed, the, I tried the isolated bank art. And unfortunately, I was not very happy with my results of arthroscopic bank art. I have to, to confess that I think an open bank art is not exactly the same surgery. And my colleagues, Pierre Monsat from the government hospital in the same city, still perform open bank art. And it does not have so many failures than the arthroscopic bank art. So I think the open and and arthroscopic procedure for bank art is not exactly the same probably. But because of my failure, and because I wanted to make all my procedure arthroscopically, I developed the bipolar fixation, bank art plus remplissage, in fact. 
and I've stopped the open lethargy because I wanted to make it uh, arthroscopic. I, I didn't want to develop open procedure, but unfortunately, I was not very happy. And in 2010, it was possible to make arthroscopic lethargy. So this is reason why I uh, I went through this way for the full arthroscopic lethargy. And what percentage of your patients do you add remplissage to an arthroscopic lethargy? Or very few cases. Uh, at the very beginning, you want you always want to make better than your master. So uh, Laurent Lafosse made arthroscopic lethargy. I wanted to make better arthroscopic lethargy plus remplissage. It, it was totally useless, in fact, for, 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 for all my patients, except in epileptic procedures. I have two cases of epileptic procedure, and after failed uh, arthroscopic lethargy, I revised with a head and binet plus remplissage, and it works, because you need a very big piece of bone, and, and probably the, 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 the lethargy is too small. And have you ever needed to do an, a bony procedure for the hill sacs in addition to letter J? I, I think it's a great idea. And I, I, I follow all these publications. I think it's a great idea because uh, when the hill sacs is really significant and very, very medial, if you want to make a real remplissage, you, you, you create a limitation of your, of, your, of your shoulder. So I think it could be a very good indication in epileptic uh, in, in, when you have 30 or 40 percent of defect of the head, yes, I think it's a good idea. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Kenny here? I have one question. Have one question. Yes. I do know that uh, if you do lethargy when there is no bone uh, bone deficit on the denoid surface, chances of graft lysis will be very high. Is there any difference when you are doing lethargy when there is uh, no. graft, uh, bone uh, deficit less than 20 percent and bone deficit more than 20 percent in your series? Oh, so, so you, uh, I'm not sure having understood the question. Uh, the question is, uh, what about if there is no glenoid bone loss and I do a lethargy? Yes, yes. yes. Less than 20% bone loss, if you do lethargy, is, is chances of graft lysis is very high rather than on the other side, when the deficit is more than 20%. The um, question is on bone graft lysis or graft absorption for yes. bone loss below 20% or more than 20% glenoid bone loss. You, you're right. This is one of the points of the lethargy. When you have a normal glenoid and you do a lethargy, you will have a significant osteolysis. Correct. Uh, so in that situation, probably it's not useful to take uh, a very big piece of bone. Maybe just a bristle is enough because you have a hammock effect. So very small piece of bone and it works because of the hammock or the sling effect. But when you have 20% of defect, I think the, the normal lethargy is better because you have no osteolysis. In fact, if you, if you use a very big bone graft and you have an osteolysis, you will have an impingement between the head of a screw and your subscap in rotation. So I, I totally agree with you. In case of very small lunar bone loss, either you do a bank graft or bipolar fixation, I, I totally agree with you especially in hyperlaxity, because hyperlaxity there is no between defect, uh, but a very piece of a small bone, and like the Pascal bone, you're right. Ja, you don't believe in this endobutton system of fixation for the graft? I believe in it, but uh, I have two or three comments. First of all, for me, it's more demanding, because one button is demanding with lots of sutures, so two buttons like Philip Valenti, it's, it's just uh, it could be a nightmare because you can mix things inside. We, you, we are using screw as we are orthopedics since since all our, our lives. It's so easy with a screw, and the compression sensation is very important. Mm. The wow. problem of a screw is the direction, and at the very beginning, you are afraid about the brachial plexus and your direction is not very good. But if you, if you play it's a rotation with your shoulder, if you follow the technique, it becomes very, very easy. There is one advantage with a, with a button, and I think it's a good indication. When you want to make a head and ebinet procedure, you can open the rotator interval and you can pull your graph through the rotator interval 
on to begin with. You don't have to do any splits. So this is a great advantage when you want to make a head any minute. And when you want to make a posterior graft, it's possible also with full rotor turn table. Yeah. So the buttons could have some advantages. Okay. Okay. Can you can sir? We can move ahead with uh, yes. what interesting case Ovik has come okay. with because Ovik, back again. Because, yes, because okay. he has had an excellent case on voice chip because there will be just some comment on that how people are doing because Biplob is there still doing voice chip and uh, Devasi Chatterjee sir is also there. Yeah, there yeah, because he, he has done a lot, so we'll take take the opinion of people. So this guy, uh, <coughs> his, his profession is playing video games. <coughs> so he's 23 years old. Video games. Yeah. <laughs> he makes money by playing video games. Okay. That was, I just asked him what he, what he does for a living. And uh, so he uh, underwent this procedure, Boicha, uh, at the age of 21. <coughs> 21. And for a recurrent dislocation of the shoulder, right shoulder. And operated again after one year. He could not give the details and he did not have the uh, history and the discharge summary. But what I could make out, his doctor said that something's not right, I need to fix it. What I could gather is probably the screw had come out and he was trying to fix it back. Uh, that was, I could make out. There were no written documents there. So then he came to me. This was his x-ray, as you can see. Uh, for I have never done a boy job, so it took me a while to figure out what this was. And I'll show you his clinical examination. <clears throat> now, like I said, I always examine this kind of and all my patients. Although you find that he doesn't have any discus here, discus here, but if you see, there's a muscle firing at this infraspinatus. That means his motions are not smooth. Can you see this muscle firing there? Now he has two scar marks here, one here and one here. He's got a lot of inferior subluxation as you can see from this part. He's not hyperlax. He's not hyperlax, His all other joints are absolutely normal. Now this is interesting. I did not examine him, he did it himself. Now let's see that once more. It comes with a loud noise. Goes back. So I first thing uh, I decided to do a, a MRI and a CT scan. The MRI doctor uh, was not sure whether he'll be able to do the MRI. He was not sure about the quality. He was not sure about the artifacts. So. They abandoned the procedure MRI and we just, I'm just going to share one picture of the CT scan that's all. So this was what was the CT scan. There's no bone loss there. And this is the washer. This is the screw. I'm sure this is that piece of bone has resolved there. Whatever piece was there. Are you sure that his humoral is coming now? A big Roshan, what did you say? Are you are you very sure that his humoral his head is coming out? He, yeah, that he, 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 he saw the video. No, yes, is, yes. He, is he a voluntary dislocator? Yes. Right now he's become. Right now he's become, but he was not like this. He was absolutely fine. Uh, uh, he's only he had two or three dislocations playing cricket. That's initially when I asked him, do you did you dislocate voluntary? Because That's no. How did they start? The two scars were there. One was for the boy, and the second was, I think, was for his uh, second procedure. They started with trauma, you told? Yes, trauma while playing cricket. Cricket. But cricket doesn't, uh, unless it is a big traumatic event in cricket, it is very difficult to get a dislocation. Most, most, he had, they, he had a dislocation while playing cricket twice, and then he underwent. So, interestingly, he never, he never underwent an MRI uh, before the surgery also. So there was no MRI before the surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. 
the decision was taken and this was the surgery was done boy what are the two scars one was for the initial boy chop and okay. after one is the probably the, the screw thing okay screw reposition screw reposition yeah yeah screw reposition probably so what's the do you have the ct scans yeah only i have, i'm showing just one scan where it shows there is no bone loss that's all or oh, that is the 3d one the 3d one okay status of the subscapularis subscapularis muscle status absolutely fine his only problem is inferior laxity that's it hmm. tell him to again continue with his profession <laughs> <laughs> because that is the probably he could understood that uh, he, this is the safest profession before his surgery and now after his surgery also he has to continue that profession yeah so no he the problem is every time he has his dislocation he is in pain i would say that he is a voluntary dislocator because his dislocations are painful but he is not dislocating on your tidical examination in the front yeah, yeah so he is grossly apprehensive also when i when i he is doing a controlled dislocation he knows how to do it when i am doing it myself he stops me he doesn't let me dislocate but but but, but to, after two approach from the front even if you do a sham operation the he the shoulder doesn't dislocate in the front and that's why i put up this case yes that's why you are, i am asking you that we continue him with his own profession because that is the he is safest profession for him yeah. Yeah. I, I, have, I, have I have a different, different approach here week number 1 uh this man i will still consider him as one of those voluntary yes, uh, dislocators who after one initial most of them they begin with one story of a trauma that's how it begins and is doing that number 2 look at his marfanoid habitus this typical lanky fellow and number 3 he is almost painless way of doing this instability demonstrated on the examination couch so he is that for me the operation this is not boy chip i can tell you because the incision was wrong and i can hardly see any bony mark which has healed there is no healing mark on the osteotomy which is barely visible uh, so forget about the operation and i in my book this man probably almost definitely is a voluntary dislocation should be managed non operative yes because he has to only manage by non operative means if you touch him again you will just add one operation to him i think we are missing a big point here because yes. uh, as as the history suggests he had a traumatic instability and later on it became a voluntary dislocator so i feel what could have happened is initially he had a anterior bankart lesion which was progress into the posterior and now he has got a global instability which is described as 270 degree lateral lesions you know anterior inferior and posterior so all the lateral lesions could be causing his uh, home to be uh, you know unstable anterior inferiorly or inferiorly that is why he is able to dislocate his hand and such situations i think doing a thorough investigation and in my case i will just uh, convince the patient but i will try and surgical repair for anterior inferior and uh, posterior lateral plication as well as repair uh, and uh, something known as capsular labroplasty like you know you uh, elevate yes, the capsule understand along, along with labrum and then try to tighten it anteriorly so that you can and same time i will try to remove that uh, screw at the same procedure because i think uh, the uh, screw will be a cause of pain because uh, instability will not give him pain pain is because of that screw and the problem related to that screw well brochure that is exactly what is the treatment for uh, this sort of uh, uh, voluntary instability yes. you try conservative first if it fails then you do a pan capsular plication or tightening but yes. first you must give him a very good chance of good rehab don't touch him right now that's my suggestion yes because i think i think if you touch him now he will be just coming can, again after six can months. i can i know why the primary surgery was done if he was a voluntary traumatic traumatic, traumatic dislocation traumatic. So that is so, that is pretty debatable uh, yes. what surgery was done so if it is a traumatic i think the, the algorithm will be different if it is a atraumatic yes. dislocation then 
probably probably roshan you have missed the fast history he told rohit told that he just got that dislocation during playing cricket but it was not like history that he had to be reduced and all this i think this was a trivial trauma he started with the trivial trauma and probably he is having this of voluntary thought sort of thing what is uh, other seniors are telling this is something where i would uh, be very wary about going back again to do any surgery would you know i agree with uh, shonendu uh, he, he said he was had it doing doing a uh, playing cricket but how significant was it was it reduced there or did he have to go to the hospital to get it reduced that's hard to tell and uh, the mri does not he does not have an mri so we don't have any. to the what we have now is what is presenting with and what is presenting with is pretty much like what is called a voluntary dislocation so with a voluntary dislocator we'll be very wary about going going in for surgery dr kenny your opinion on this from the uh, history and the clinics it's a difficult case uh, what i think is first of all for me probably this patient is hyperlax for three reasons first of all he seems to have a super sign second uh, it is an inferior instability so this is very rare and number two uh, the, sorry number two the scar is not very nice and we we can see such a scar in case of hyperlaxity with hyperelasticity and no, number three in fact the ct scan is normal there is no bleeding with bone loss so for me probably this guy is a hyperlax first point second point i think we have to to propose a surgery for this guy because he seems to to have lots of problems with his shoulder with pain and we cannot leave it leave him like that and i'm not sure the physio will be very efficient so if i have to do a revision it's not possible to take uh, the bone block with the lethargy because it has already been done and very difficult maybe maybe had any been at very distal position it but maybe it could be an indication of a new technique of Philip Colin and Alexandre Lederman the dynamic bicep stabilization because it's a soft tissue procedure which reinforces the capsule in case of hyperlaxity and it's come under uh, the neck of the humerus so maybe it could be a good indication right anybody needs anybody have any additional comment on this uh, yes, how many of you will just leave it how many of you will operate <laughs> i will leave it who will operate roshan will operate i think roshan roshan i know that i know that roshan will operate can you will operate no, no i will i will i will you know i will i will be very systematic in this case because he is a voluntary dislocator i first like to take out that implant and then maybe at later date i will like to do the mri to analyze the intraarticular pathology if there is a associated liberal lesion i know the results will be far better if there is no liberal lesion and it's a voluntary dislocator because of laxity by the time i i, I just like to ask abhi is there any generalized laxity in other hand no i did not find that's what i said uh, so it's a it, it's, it's not a generalized laxity it is you can't have laxity only in one shoulder it will generalize it will have everywhere no you can this so is can isis isis investigation localized hyperlaxity is one of the one of the things you can have so, in so, 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 so i have got a question to you told that you will go sequentially or once after screwing taking the screw and you will go with the mr then you plan so yes. my, if you plan like that for, my plan will be if i go uh, totally going to be surgery probably i will take the screw in the is the, the, the day i will go for a just a look for the arthroscope what is the harm in it you can do that but you know is a 5 minute talk to look to the do look in naked eyes rather than see, to believe on the mri yeah that's true but before going in i want to make it sure that what i'm going to face if i'm going to face a this 270 degree liberal lesion you were already now, going with the with the screw you were you were taking the screw giving a small incision why not we put put a small leak on the back Yeah, you can do that. No problem. Diagnostic scoping. Diagnostic sort of thing. Yeah, and at later date or maybe same time, you convince the patient that if I find a liberal lesion, I repair it. I will then. I will ask Jean Kenny one question. That do you support this 
voice chip operation or whether there is any believer still there in in your country oh uh, sorry i did not understood could you repeat the voice chip the voice chip operation do you still there is any believer in your country or in whole europe you know some people that they are still believing on voice chip in what yes. believe in voice what voice chip operation transferring the coracoid and rerouting through the subscap and again fixing in the front of the coracoid oh no i i, I honestly i did not know this technique so it's very totally new for me and few, nobody in france knows or use this technique even i didn't knew it first time i came to know <laughs> yeah, thanks <laughs> <laughs> this is mentioned in Campbell. It is Campbell. It is there. Campbell. It is there. No, no. Even so, if it's it's there, people, people are still doing some part of the uh, some part of the uh, world is still doing it because the it is the uh, some even I I think Kanchan sir might be telling uh, even some uh, Russian people and some uh, other guys are also doing this. Kanchan sir, see, this is a surgery that was described in the late forties at and. Uh, uh, Bristol probably was described around the late 40s, but finally described in late 50s. And uh, uh, the letter he described his in the early 50s. So there was a huge, uh, a huge uh, pull towards doing all kinds of sling surgeries, and they all belonged believed in the same thing. So this one was slightly better because it went through the uh, through the uh, subscapula. Letters is the initial technique was transecting the subscapularis, putting it there, then putting it back. But they described it later. Now, Boetia was described in Poland, and a lot of Polish and Russian surgeons still do it. Actually, yes, yes, that I'm referring. Yeah, it's a, it's a sling operation, and like I said, there are so many indirect surgeries that have. Rosen, I, Rosen, I can caution you one one thing. One thing that if you if you it's take somebody low from it, Russia, no, no, no. Rosen, everybody. The more you see, people who do not read history make the same mistakes. Rosen, I can I can give you one cause. I don't want to make mistake again. You know, yeah, yeah. The, historically it was a mistake. We will come back. I asked Jean Kenny, what was he doing in 2000? He was doing letter J. Then he went on to do arthroscopy. He's gone back to letter J now. Open letter J. Now letter J is increasing everywhere in the world. But when you look at our, like you just mentioned, your look at your cases. You've got 90, 80% of arthroscopic stabilization. So what is true today may not be the same later. And like Jean Kenny mentioned, open letter J and arthroscopic letter J, no matter how often we, we beat, how, how often we uh, beat our chest about it, most people do believe that they are not the same because you can do more tightening anteriorly. The very surgery itself does a lot more tightening. So open letter J is a slight, oh, I'm sorry, open, a bank card is slightly different from a throscopy bank card. The results okay. are different as well. So nothing is uh, absolute in medical history. You know, what is wonderful for today may not be the same when you look back later. And I think the best thing in orthopedics that we know that everything comes a full circle is when you look at the treatment for talipus. How come, how come the Boyce procedure is very popular in Kolkata is not it's been not known in Mumbai? It's not, it's not they popular. They are in the same country. No, but they had one surgeon who did a large number. No, of it's it. not, not like in Kolkata. That's, but you also, have to remember, you also have to remember Roshan. Surprisingly, it's not been popular or ever heard in Indian. Uh, no, you've never heard, heard, that heard about it. Thing. What, is, what you do not realize is shoulder surgery has been very popular in Calcutta from the 50s. You get the largest number of papers from shoulder surgery, and Dr. Saha's name is in every book on shoulder surgery. Yeah, I know. Dr. Saha is shoulder, there has been an interest in shoulder for most people in surgery for a long, long time. The shoulder interest uh, came to in the other surgeons a little later. Dr. Bokshi also worked with Dr. Saha, and so he got interested in. But people. I think not that every surgery in history needs to be uh, uh, makes a comeback. Letarjay is an exception. No, but all these surgeries have a reason to be remembered and to understand. And I think even uh, today, the way Letarjay has progressed, there is a lot of learning from these surgeries which has come into Letarjay. So, what Kanchanda, I think, has said right, anybody who tries to forget history probably uh, is not doing the right thing. And a lot of clinical decisions are today based on what we have learned by the mistakes in past. And, uh, I I, th I think Bristow was the first thing that just came two three years before the 
Latterji because I think remember the Latterji probably in 1954 and Bristow was referred in 1952. No, so I think, no. Bristow was first described by his student. Student, yeah. He, so, he went back to South Africa and then reported it in 1958. Yes. So primarily, primarily yeah. it was yeah. so it was started oh, in. But he wrote, lost. Uh, sorry. With Bristow in the early 50s. So Bristol did it in the early 50s. But yeah, it was early 50s, that I'm referring, yeah. It was before, it was before, before Latter-J. It was described by Helfet in 1958. And do you know who put in that screw for Bristol? Initially, it was no, there was no screw. And there's Roshan laughing. Not it's me. To learn. <laughs> Ken Gerber put in that screw. Yes. With uh, Bristol, that was Christian Gerber putting it in there. So we have that uh, historical yeah. people living and working still. So we need to remember that. Yes. And uh, 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 Abhik, I need to Abhik, just what ask you, did, what you did. What you did. Yeah, exactly. What you did, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so <clears throat> any such cases where you need to do a redo surgery, my philosophy is very simple. Is don't touch first. The first go, just don't touch. Uh, so this guy came to me five times after that. He was very keen on getting himself operated. Uh, so we put up on a... Uh, rehab where we started strengthening his core muscles, core muscles mostly, because then we found out my physio went to his house and his posture was really horrible. You know, playing video games, the moment he actually started working on his core muscles and his scapular muscles, he surprisingly became better. And uh, his this habitual dislocation, he stopped doing it. And there's a lot of psychological factors to it, and uh, which we have worked on. So bottom line is he. Better now, I won't say he's cured. He's better. His habitual dislocation has come down a lot. And he's still back to playing his video games, of course, with a better posture. How is his pain? His pain has gone. Oh, that is more important because yes, uh, more, yeah. part of part of his problem was more because of pain. And I believe... Is he, is he good to pain? play any contact games? Uh, no. <laughs> is he, is he, only, is he only planning for marriage? Game. Only is he contact planning for a marriage? Like, marriage? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there, those are those are safe contact games. Safe contact. Hundred percent, hundred percent recurrence. He'll come back with hundred percent recurrence. Depends. Oh, after, how, after first contact. Game. Roshan, Roshan, you are giving your experiences here. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have good shoulders. Roshan, <clears throat> Roshan, no. <clears throat> so this is. Let me tell you this. So this I learned from a surgeon in Malaygaon. Now, he, how he would convince a patient for a shoulder stabilization surgery? Malaygaon. Where is Malaygaon. this? Malaygaon. So young, young Manish, Manish. So young people. Yeah. 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 Where is this Malaygaon? Russia. Many no, Malaygaon. In Arre, Malaygaon, India. Mein hai. Maharashtra is very close to you. Maharashtra is Malaygaon. Well, close to you rather than it is far. Maharashtra is Malaygaon. Pune ke pas. Malaygaon. Ah, I Pune think ke pas. Uh, Malaygaon, yeah. So soon na. So what happened? This. So he told me. Say one of the ways he convinces patient that especially young guys. So he said that you know, while while. While doing your contact uh, sports, yeah, <laughs> contact sports in bed, there's a pretty high chance you're going to dislocate. Yes, because you lost your that terminology. That's why I remember. Especially, that especially hips. Okay. Okay. One, one, the, you have to same, summarize now. The same analogy the hip surgeons would use. If you have a stiff hip, they would say that you know get your ASRs done and replacements done in young arthritic hips. Same thing he told me, and believe me or not, his conversion rate was hundred percent. All of them would come back for surgery. Kanchanda, I think uh, you need to do I, the I, honors I, I, now. I, I, Kanchanda, so you didn't tell your patient? It's this going patient? in a different direction oh, altogether. Yeah, yeah. Convincing patients for surgery. Uh, Kanchanda, do you want to speak about the slab or do we close down? No, no, we can we can close now because already this was a really yeah, uh, excellent, 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 excellent. Day. Already we have shot half an hour. So yeah. I think I think um, uh, I think you can just give you and uh, Jin Kenny can give the take home message whatever we have learned. Today, I think I will request Jean first, then Kanchunda will ask Peter Jean to tell us about, yes, what, about what he how, how you felt, how you felt about coming here, whatever we have just summarized today. Jean, we're waiting for you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was not true. So you give, you want me to give a take home message? Yeah, yeah like two days. Oh. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, it's great to can share and discuss together. And I think uh, this uh, initiative and it's, it must be uh, renewed. Uh, we have to, to, to make more and more in the future such a, such a meeting. And uh, thank you very much for your very kind invitation. It was very interesting to discuss 
uh, just uh, to to see I, I share my experience. I do, I do not say I'm right. I just say what I'm doing today. This is just what you have to remember about uh, my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Roshan, what's your take? Or what's your give? Uh, I can't give you anything, but uh, I'm very sure that uh, this such symposiums are going to add knowledge to the peop uh, people's understanding about the instability. I'm very sure I learned few uh, historical surgeries, as well as the uh, understanding of the uh, instability with Dr. Jean Kenny, as well as with Dr. Jaffe Dumps, and a fantastic demonstration by Dr. Raju and Debashish and initial introduction by Dr. Vikas, which I missed it, a few slides. So I think it was a very good meeting and more and more such meetings will give us, make us a better shoulder surgeon so that we can understand the biomechanics and anatomy of the shoulder. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. I think we'll close down on the fact that the most people are in agreement with what we do and what we do not do. Yes. And I think what has transpired is that in our country, we still tend to do a little more of soft tissue surgery. And probably this has to do with the amount of activity level with our, our patients and compl compliance that our patients exhibit as oppo opposed to the more athletic people or, or sports-oriented people of the West, probably. Again, time will tell us which is right and which is not right. But most people seem to be in agreement about the... Uh, investigations about the physical examinations and OBIC has added to our knowledge by saying that scapular dyskinesia should be looked into. And I have always, always thought that when OBIC brings this up, I'll do it. For some reason or the other, I don't seem to be able to do it all the time, but I think this is an important thing that we can add. And it was wonderfully organized. And thank you very much on a Sunday. I appreciate Rosha and Jacani and uh, uh, Jab Williams spending the time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Bye.